right? Good morning. We're going to go ahead and call today's meeting to order. We're going to open it with um, prayer, and then I will ask Commissioner Cole to lead us in the pledge. So if you will, please rise with me. Rise with me. And Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity, God, to gather here today. I pray that you'll bestow wisdom and knowledge beyond our years on us today, God. I pray, Lord, that you will build a hedge of protection around all the families that are represented here today. And we'll be sure to give you the honor and the glory, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Please. Thank you so much. Uh, first order, I just want to ask if any of our uh, staff members or other elected officials or commissioners have any additions or amendments to today's agenda. Roger. Yes, yes, Commissioner. I have laid uh, some supplemental information for item number five, engineer's report, in front of each of you. Thank you. Commissioner Cole. Thank you. Just the information item. There was a very bad accident on Interstate 10 this morning, right on top of the Garson Point Bridge. A, a semi truck jackknifed and in there, and uh, <coughs> traffic's backed up way past Highway 87 on 90, and way up the interstate. So uh, if you have to go that way, or there are people coming in from that way, you know anybody? That's probably that's why uh, Commissioner Peach is late this morning because it's pretty good tie up. I. If I hadn't known to go through the industrial parking down Johnson Road, I'd, I'd be in the same predicament. So just if you know anybody, give them a call, tell them not to bother. So. Anybody else? All right. Hearing none, we'll approve today's agenda. <clears throat> uh, first item, just information only. We're going to have a legislative update uh, by Johnson and Blanton, our lobbying firm out of Tallahassee. They'll be here Thursday, the 24th. Uh, also, we'll have a proclamation for Big Brothers, Big Sisters on Thursday, January 24th. This time, we'll move into public forum. I see we've got quite a few folks here today, and we, uh, as always, appreciate you coming out today. Uh, the only thing I would ask as we get started on this is please remember to place your cell phones or any other electronic device on uh, silent mode just out of respect of everybody here. <clears throat> we'll also ask as you come up, please make sure you fill out a speaker form uh, and return it to the clerk's office as well as uh, just state your name and address as you approach the podium. Uh, we do have a, a three minute timer that's in effect and that's just so that we can get through uh, everybody that's here to speak today. Uh, so with that, if anybody would like to address uh, the commission on anything that is not a already scheduled agenda item now would be the time. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you back. It's nice to see you too. Um, my name is Dara Lynn Hardigan. I'm the president of Save Our Soundside. I live at 4601 Soundside Drive. And um, I understand that Mr. Blaylock has uh, once again approved a preliminary plat for Smart Living LLC in Lewis Breland, um, which covers hundreds of acres in the area of River Birch Road and Edgewood Drive. Save Our Soundside has extensive experience with this developer, and you know his track record because we've brought it to your attention numerous times. Now, on this 210 acres, they plan 284 lots, and I'm, ref I'm referring to uh, Forest Bay Estates and uh, Bradley Estates. Uh, it's referred to as both, I do believe. But um, uh, there's 284 lots, and according to the Santa Rosa Property Appraisers website, 180 acres uh, is marsh and swampland. Uh, I don't think you can, without uh, totally destroying the wetlands uh, in that area, make that work. 
and as you know the wetlands um, this area depends on them for water quality and flood control and survival of the ecosystem. Uh, now it's coming to you for approval and I've heard from the people in that area and it seems that the proper studies have not been done for a project of this size. There are endangered species in that forested land and the existing homeowners will be affected by displaced uh, storm water over there just like what happened to us in Soundside. Um, I don't see how the proper studies can be done in this rapid fire succession. Um, now, I've been standing before you meeting after meeting for months now asking for controlled growth and code enforcement and mitigation for damage done by developers. We've talked about flooding and traffic and water quality and destruction of um, uh, wildlife habitats and decreased property values. Uh, in the Land Development Code under Section 4.03.00, uh, the public health, safety, comfort, economy, order, appearance, convenience, and general welfare require the harmonious, orderly, and progressive development of land within Florida and its incorporated municipalities and counties. Now this public believes that the health, safety, comfort, economy, order, appearance, convenience, and general welfare <coughs> has been disharmoniously affected by the rapid growth that South Santa Rosa um, is experiencing right now. Um, and you know that when I come before you, I represent hundreds of people from Navarre to Gulf Breeze, and they reach out to me, and they talk to me, and they send me letters, and you know, I'm speaking for them. They're angry and they're frustrated because they feel betrayed. And they believe that you guys are looking out for the developer's interests to the detriment of their own interests. Now, I don't know why you would do that and why you would risk the people's trust like that. Um, if you're being threatened or intimidated or coerced in any way, we would stand by you and get the proper authorities involved, okay? But if not, if you've just chosen to sacrifice our way of life and the proper stewardship of the area that we love on the altar of gain or growth or greed, we will not forget this, and we're urging you for once not to approve this development for Breland and for Smart Living LLC. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Michael Brower. I live at 5073 Mandevilla Boulevard in Gulf Breeze. I am the Vice President of Save Our Soundside. For the official record, I asked the Board of County Commissioners the following three questions. First, has Santa Rosa County government considered your, that your unabated <coughs> approval of permits which regularly result in the altering of the Gulf coastal lowlands and floodplain, draining, artificial filling, and raising of Gulf coastal wetlands on all the areas of the coastal areas of the Fairmont Peninsula, and associated stormwater pollution and runoff flooding may well trigger claims liabilities under Florida's Harris Act of 1995 as offended, appended. Second, are you aware of the hundreds of recent complaints, over 800? Negative reviews, 191 one star out of uh, 227 negative reviews, and current continuing class action and individual torts, summary judgments, environmental fines and sanctions against the developers including Breland Homes, working under the D.H. Horton corporate umbrella. 
or the repeated public threats made by the founder of Breland Companies <coughs> to the mayor of Huntsville, Alabama, promising, threatening him many times to take him to a dark place for not developing, uh, submitting to the developer's wishes. I refer you to HTTPS colon backslash backslash YouTube that's uh, Y-O-U-T-U -U dot B-E backslash F-S-A-G-0-P-R-T-J-R-0 and HTTPS colon backslash backslash www.consumeraffairs.com housing backslash dr horton dot html finally does anybody in Santa Rosa County, Santa Rosa County government from the board of commissioners to the county administrator to the zoning and planning board to the complaints offer the compliance officers consider the character or history of past complaints current and continuing class action and individual torts summary judgments, environmental signs and sanctions, <clears throat> sanctions against developers, including Breland Homes, and, working, uh, and those working under the D.H. Horton uh, corporate umbrella. We, the citizens of Santa Rosa County, do wonder whether you do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Elton Kellum, 6256 East Bay Boulevard. First, I'd like to say that um, I respect uh, Mr. Blaylock, but I disagree with his uh, recommendation to this board to approve this project. And I say that because of the importance of water to Santa Rosa County. We have three rivers, the Blackwater, the Yellow, the Shoal, that all flow into East Bay. That's important because that, that produces oysters, legendary oysters. Oysters they don't have in Apalachicola anymore, or Mobile. And there's a proposal here to develop an area, which I personally know, having lived through Ivan, was inundated with water. And if you look at the hydraulics of it, it's almost always inundated with water. If you walk across in the woods, and I've provided thumb drives of that for you, you'll see that there's all sorts of species out there that are protected and it's definitely wetlands. There's springs bubbling up out of the water out there. That's what supports the oysters in the bay, the seafood, the places we swim. <coughs> but yet we spend money on subdivisions for sewer systems, uh, which is ridiculous because we need to replumb the entire county around these outstanding waterways and bays that we live on. And if we don't, it's all going to come crashing down one day. Last year, we dodged a big bullet with Ivan. Not Ivan, huh? Michael. Michael. I've been through uh, Cleel, Oakville, Aaron, Dennis. Uh, I've had a little experience. And I can tell you, if we have the convergence to say maybe one coming from the Caribbean with the oil that's still leaking from the wells out there that I used to work on, and the red tide coming up from South Florida, and all of a sudden it's off Midway and comes into Santa Rosa County, we're in big trouble. They can't even pay for the claims, the Irma claims, the FEMA claims in South Florida right now. They haven't even touched Bay County. And I, I bet if you brought an engineer over here from Bay County to give his opinion on this project, he'd tell you, we can't even get rid of the crap that we built there already. Why do you want to put more down there, especially along the water? It's absolutely insane. I think it's malfeasance, misfeasance, whatever you want to call it. O.C. Mills went to jail for 26 months for filling in a ditch in his yard down the road. The stuff that's going up on Bergen Road, you'd still be, be in jail if you were prosecuted back in those days. I'm not threatening y'all with criminal action. 
There may be a tour here. You might go talk to Alexander Shinar or the Morgan people. They may think of something. But you need to think long and hard about what you do today. Because it not only impacts you, me, everybody out here. Thank you, Mr. Kill. If I left anything out, it's in the handout. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to address the board. My name is Fritz Buss. I live at, with my wife, at 2469 West Bayshore Road in Gulf Breeze. We began this meeting with a pledge of allegiance to the flag. When we all committed to follow the democratic process to resolve conflicts involving our personal welfare. Yesterday on Martin Luther King's day, our government at all levels affirmed these principles of individually equal rights. Here, these folks are demonstrating their trust in you, our representatives to uphold this charge and defend their right to continue living in an environment they chose and they paid for which is safe and natural. On the other side of this conflict are a small number of very wealthy and politically powerful adversaries who care little about the health and welfare of these petitioners. Ironically, given the course of this appeal, you, our representatives, are unaccountable by the electoral process to these adversaries. For you, therefore, as our elected advocates, this is truly a test of the oath you all swore to, to protect the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness of these, your constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Scott Zabarin. I live on Soundside Drive along with everyone behind me. Um, I hate public speaking. I've said that to you guys one time before coming up here. I felt impelled to talk after Dara talked about harmonious living. Um, this developer, Breland Homes, or um, whoever they've changed names time and again, the harmonious part is what kind of touched me and made me want to come up here and talk to you guys. Uh, I shouldn't have to be policing, which I don't know if that's the right term or right verb to use, policing what these people are doing to develop. They're not putting in proper infrastructure for sounds or for water runoff or any type of things like that there wasn't a proper entrance until we said something then they put in a proper entrance they were dewatering without a permit until someone called and said there's no dewatering permit these people are rampant is the correct term to use rampant growth and it's not harmonious with what's going on um, pumping water into adjacent waterways without any type of filter system until we speak up and call somebody nothing's done about it I understand we have agencies that come out and look at that, but we are having to protect ourselves because those agencies aren't doing the work until we call them. And that's fine. You guys can't be everywhere all, play, all times. So you, I guess, intend us to help do that, which we're happy to do. And we're here saying they're not doing the proper work. And unfortunately, it's polluting our area and more growth. They're going to do more unless people like these people behind us continue to police their activities. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. We're still in public forum, so <clears throat> anybody that has any issues to address on items that are not on slated on the agenda, please come forward. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. My name is Michael Stanley. I live at 1694 Champaign Avenue, Gulf Breeze. I'm here to uh, address the Board of Commissioners on the process of, of the MSBU, uh, Municipal Service Benefit Unit. Um, it's my understanding that we've gone to a two-step process. And um, I believe that the uh, doing a two-step process is, gonna, is going to delay the, any type of project that the MSBUs are are focused uh, towards, and in delaying it, 
Um, as you know, as time goes on, prices increase. There may be regulations that come out that may uh, cause an increase in, in cost uh, for the project. So I'm, I'm here to ask the commissioners if they would um, look at the, um, this particular MSBU and see how um, we have uh, made it so it's, um, it would be more uh, cost effective um, with the parameters that we put in place. Um, I have uh, Paul Battle here with uh, Rebel Battle uh, Engineering, and they have a lot of experience in doing these MSBUs. Um, it's my understanding that in previous MSBUs were, um, there was a shortfall, um, and it's my understanding, I don't know if this is true or not, it's my understanding that the, the, um, the, there wasn't uh, the knowledge of how to address the MSBUs to where um, knowing that it's just an estimate, it's not a, it's not a firm quote when the MSBU is presented and that in the end result after, after the uh, commission vote on it in August that there's a firm quote that's provided and sometimes there's a lot of differences in between the quote and the estimate. So um, Paul has, um, has uh, made up a estimate to show that there's enough of a contingency in there that we won't have that issue that we had in the last time we did this. So I'm asking if we can make this a one-step <coughs> process again rather than doing the two-step, mainly because delay could cause increased cost in, in the project and um, two, we have a, uh, a, uh, a firm that knows exactly what needs to be done to make these work. And he's never had an issue. This company has never had an issue with any uh, cost overruns to where they had to go back and, and uh, redo the process. Thank you. Thank you. Just, is, it, is this something that Commissioner Lynch is working with offline of this? I, I know we haven't changed it since. It's the two years I've been on the board. Mr. So. Chairman, it's, it's not something I'm, I'm working on offline. I did speak with Mr. Stanley. Uh, he had sent an email uh, asking to change our process to allow them to do the MSBU for this development, uh, in this area, in a, in a one-step process rather than two-step process. The background is um, before I got on the board 10 years ago, there was an, in, uh, an MSBU uh, proposed for Ponderosa, I believe it was. The uh, and back then we did a one-step process. The uh, cost estimate that was utilized to obtain the si the signatures on the petition was woefully inadequate. So when the bids came in, they were they were way high. So uh, the project was canceled. Well. The MSBU had been in place for two years or more at that point. So the residents, the, the property owners on Ponderosa had been paying for two years and then they didn't see any results after that. The MSBU was terminated. Um, then there was the MSBU on Cornell, which is adjacent to the, the property under consideration for the, uh, the MSBU that Mr. Stanley's considering now. And same situation, we had, uh, the MSBU was petitioned. The costs came back. I don't know how, how much higher than the original estimate, but it was significantly higher uh, than the original estimate. So it had to go out, be repetitioned. It ended up languishing here for about what, three years, I guess, um, before it was ultimately approved. So, and, and we had another little duck, I think, was in the same or similar circumstance. The problem is these MSBUs have been in areas where there is, uh, they're, they're, they're constrained in terms of the, the amount of property they have to work with, wetlands in the area. Uh, so the initial engineering, the initial, initial guesstimate doesn't always comport with what the ultimate engineering shows in terms of what's going to be required in order to 
pave the roads, put in the uh, sewer, put in the water, and account for the retention ponds. So we went to, and I don't know when it was, two years, three years ago, right after the last Cornell MSBU, we went to a two-step process for MSBUs where the initial step, the initial MSBU approved is to fund the design and engineering and cost estimate for the project. Once that is done, then we have, the, the petitioner has a firm number that they can use to get the MSBU for construction. So rather than lump it all together on a guess, albeit an educated guess, uh, I know Mr. Battle does, does very good work, um, we, the residents know up front that what they're paying for is the engineering and the study to determine whether or not a construction MSBU would be feasible. So uh, that's, I, I indicated to Mr. Stanley, I didn't support changing that process. I understand it, it's, it, it will lead to a delay because you have to do the engineering before you can do your construction. Um, and the last project that, that he did down on Cornell and off Cornell, it, it turned out very nice. It's, uh, it was, it's really been a, 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 an asset to that community. It improved it tremendously. And I have no doubt this one will do the same thing. Um, I just, I, I don't like us putting policies in place and then amending them or waiving them on a one-off basis. So I, I told Mr. Stanley, though, I was one of five, so if he wanted to come to the public forum and, and talk to the board about it, uh, that, that he was more than welcome to. And I haven't spoken with, with Roger. I uh, did uh, talk with, with Chris Phillips in engineering uh, just to get some more background on the, uh, the two-step process, because it has been a while since we've, we've gone through it. Thank you, Commissioner Lynch. Uh, Mr. Battle. Uh, the only thing I would add is I'm familiar with Ponderosa and some of the other ones that uh, Commissioner Lynch referenced. That, that had 100 people, probably in 100 lot owners. This one has nine property owners. So I know when you have a, a more than a 20% cost overrun in the initial estimate, you have to go back and <coughs> petition everybody and they have to revote. It just, with nine people and most of them um, are multi lot owners like like he has but I, I just don't see the same risk there uh, with nine and and multiple owners they're all they're all builders so it's not like Ponderosa where we had a hundred different people from South Florida so thank you every every MSBU we've ever done has been a one process deal so I know the rule has been in place for a while but there has been situations where we've come in and done it in one process it saves a year the size of the, the size of the project is uh, it's a small MSBU in consideration in, in, in comparison to uh, other MSBUs that have been done we're only we're only looking at what maybe 30 lots mm -hmm. as compared to other subdivisions that are uh, you know 100 lots or so thank you Commissioner Cole uh, through the chair to, to Roy or Dan would this require to do this would this could we do this one on or are we gonna have to do some policy change we have the policy in place that that requires the process that mr. Lynchard outlined so we'd we'd have to waive or change our policy to do it so we there's no way to do it on a one on basis at this point a waiver to do it on a one on basis uh, well, I, 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 don't, I think the board can, it's our policy, the board can change our policy. Okay. Right. Mr. Chairman, I, Commissioner Lynchard felt this process of work in this particular case, since it's his district, I'd be willing to support that. I don't support oh, you don't? changing or waiving the policy. My no. mistake, I, that's all you support. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Salter. <coughs> clarification, Commissioner Lynchard, you don't support changing the policy back to one step? I do not. Just okay. based on our prior experience with an MSBU that's adjacent to this one and the, the other two MSBUs that we had down in the south end of the county that were, you know, 
similarly situated. We can ask, I don't know if, if, if uh, engineering would want to weigh in on, on their thoughts on it, but as, as far as me at this point, I, I don't support waiving the policy. I know it's going to, it's going to lead to a delay, but it, uh, in my mind, it, it, you eliminate a lot of problems by getting your cost known before you move forward with the construction of MSPD. Okay, so you support what's in place now? I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chris Dosev. I live at, reside at 1725 Whaley Avenue in Pensacola, Florida. I'm here today to uh, introduce to you our bridge naming initiative for the General Chappy James Bridge, Memorial Bridge and Park. Um, as you know, the bridge that's being built across Pensacola Bay at this point in time, referred to the Pensacola Bay as referred to by FDOT, Pensacola Bay Bridge, uh, is, a, is, an, is the largest uh, infrastructure project in Florida history and we propose and what we request is a resolution on behalf of the County Commissioners of Santa Rosa in support of the naming of the bridge so that we can begin the process of not only naming the bridge but also the process of raising the funds available to provide for a memorial park a statue and an F4 Phantom uh, quick uh, quick a re review of who General Chappie James was. He's a Pensacola resident, born in 1920, the youngest of 17 children. Only seven survived, and he ended up taking the name of his father. He received uh, Daniel, Daniel James Jr. His mother, Liliana James, was a school teacher in Pensacola and taught many of the children. In fact, there are students alive today that were taught by Liliana James. And uh, she taught them what it meant to be an American in a very, very special way. In fact, there's a book called Chappie that I would suggest if you'd like to get a copy, I can help you get that. Um, and uh, you'll find that she was an incredible American and so was his father. His own son, Daniel James' son, ended up becoming a Lieutenant General in the Air, in the Air Force and the commander of the Air National Guard in Texas during George W. Bush's presidency. Imagine, if you will, being a young boy in the 19, late 20s and early 30s Knowing that you lived in a segregated South, looking at all those airplanes flying out of NAS Pensacola, only thinking and dreaming to become an aviator, but not being allowed to do that. But once he was provided that opportunity, he became a Tuskegee Airman. Not only did he become a Tuskegee Airman, but he became an instructor at Tuskegee. From there, he fought in Korea and again in Vietnam. He was the operations officer for none other than Robin Olds, an American ace, flying F-4s. But at the end of the day, this man became the commander of the North American Air Defense Command, protecting a nation while he was a child that would not provide him even equal rights to go to a lunch counter. Think about that. He became America's first black four-star general amongst all the services. He passed away at the age of 58, two weeks after his 58th birthday. So uh, we, I ask uh, humbly for this, this resolution. Just know this, Pensacola City Council passed this resolution six to one. So I'm asking on behalf of the community, on behalf of the veterans community, the, on behalf of the family, of the James family, to honor, honor him and his family with this name, but more significantly, honor the service of not only all those black veterans that suffered through those times and provided honorable service to our country but for all veterans this project is one that will open up the community it is a bridge to communities it is a bridge that will span not only the communities of santa rosa or gulf breeze and pensacola but the community the generations of people in the past because as calvin coolidge said a nation the nation that forgets its defenders itself will be forgotten. I hope that we could do the right thing here in commemoration of Dr. Martin Luther King and the James family that, uh, and for our community, I ask for your indulgence that we have a resolution passed by Santa Rosa Commission. Thank you very much for your time.
Commissioner Salter. Mr. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chris, yes, sir. I've been I've been following this for quite some time, and I know that there's been some discussion about the Bell family. I believe it is Bill family. Yes, sir. Bill family. Right. And. I can address that if you'd like. If you would. Yes, sir. The current bridge is named after uh, Senator Beale, who passed away back in 1942. They named the bridge after him in 1962. So for the past 60 years, the family has been honored by the naming of this bridge. This is a new structure. It's a new bridge. And we, I, we believe that it should be provided a new name, no different than a carrier or some other ship that would be commissioned. Uh, we have. We have offered that there be a commemorative plaque, something to recognize the previous bridge named uh, individuals. I think that's appropriate. But in this particular case, if you look at that photograph, we, if, if you notice there's a flyover on the bridge, there'll be a roundabout below it, eliminating the 17th Avenue light, if you can all visualize that, which is a big deal. And just beyond that, on Waterside, we're proposing the statue and uh, acquiring F4 Phantom to be put out behind him, uh, between him and the water. We're, we're looking to engage Bob Rasmussen, former Blue Angel, director of Naval Aviation Museum, who is a local area sculptor, to do the sculpture for us. He's very, very happy to, to accommodate this request. Uh, the Beale family, again, you know, we, we see this in light of the fact that People, do, people are born beyond certain times in history. This individual is relevant to us now. We look at the education system in Escambia County. We know it's faltering significantly. We see this as an opportunity to provide the community, the entire community, an inspirational leader. And based on behalf of his mother, and based, of his, based on behalf of his own accomplishments. Every child in Escambia and Santa Rosa County should know that in this country, Everything is possible. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, back to Chris. Have you had this conversation with the Gulf Breeze City Council? Not yet. Uh, there's somewhat some turmoil there. We've made, I made the initial um, invest, uh, they're, I think, having their meeting today, but the current mayor or elected mayor has stepped down. So we're trying to let the dust settle. I, I suspect they have enough on their plate for, at the moment. We have made the, the uh, request to, um, Escambia County, and we're going to be going back to them for a final resolution. But we were very, very well received by Pensacola City Council. And that's really, I mean, that's the, the burden of proof. You know, if they're, it's going to be in their community, within their city li limits. But because this bridge spans both counties, we need to go to all four of the entities, both counties and both municipalities, to get the resolution. We've already introduced this to the legislative delegation, and that's what they need from us to be able to put together the bill. I provided each of you a copy of that bill's language. Uh, uh, legislator Mike Hill has agreed to carry that ball for, it, for us, but we need to have the resolutions so that they have obvious commitment and community support. Commissioner Cole. Thank you. Uh, before we get past this, I think it's a great idea. But I just wondered, if it was our selection committee, because there's a lot of military heroes that have born and raised and served in our county. Uh, I mentioned when I was contacted about this, Admiral Fetterman. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just, uh, and, and again, I support the idea. I just would like to know how, how the selection of a particular person was vetted. Well, we have, we are, we are submitting a proposal. Uh, we're not, and, and this is our proposal, the, the board's proposal to name it after General Chappie James. We're not saying that anyone else couldn't possibly make a pitch for a proposal like for Admiral Fetterman. Uh, I don't, is, was he born and raised in Pensacola? I'm not exactly sure of uh, his I, history. No, no, yeah, no. I, I just, I know that he passed away in Pensacola. And so what we did when we, we saw that there was an opportunity to do this with this bridge was we wanted to recognize the hometown hero of Pensacola, that being Chappie James. Uh, and keep in mind, back in the day, this is one of the things that we tend to forget in history. When he passed away, I mean, they flew him to Washington, D.C. They had his requiem mass and funeral at the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in D.C., which it was attended by nearly everybody in Washington. He was a national figure. Admiral Harris, Harry Harris, who was Sink Pack, a four-star admiral, attributed to him 
to General Chappie James his ambition to become the first Asian American in the Navy to receive four-star rank. Why? Because he spoke to him while attending Booker T. Washington High School in Pensacola, the same place that General Chappie James graduated from. He currently now is our ambassador to South Korea. So that's why we propose his name. Okay. And I, I just wanted to get that out. Sure. Yes, sir. I'm sure more, more than my, people yes, sir. than just myself. Would. Happy to answer. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We good? Chris, I, I believe we'll probably have staff uh, in the future, I guess, look at, I know I've had the opportunity to talk with you offline, and, and I feel like that's something maybe uh, after Gulf Breeze and, and Escambia County, I believe you said taking it up this week. Right. I, I don't see why we couldn't have this as an agenda item in the future to discuss. So. Keep, keep in mind, some folks, you know, have asked me, said, well, why is this urgent? I mean, the bridge is not going to be done until 2020, summer 2020. Well, interestingly enough, that would have been Chappie James' 100th birthday. So it's almost providential here. We get to celebrate 100th birthday of Chappie James and commission this bridge, if you all were to assist us in this effort. Um, but the reason we need to get it done now through the legislation is because until I secure that name on behalf of this initiative, we can't go out nationally to start raising funds for the construction of the statue and bringing in the F-4 Phantom. That's a bit of a game. Uh, we've already communicated with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. They're hunting down an aircraft for us. But whatever aircraft we get, we're going to have to refurbish, prepare properly, and then mount. There's some engineering involved there, and there's costs involved. Uh, keep in mind that we're going to reach out to every single military contractor, every single airline, every single organization that has anything to do with either Tuskegee or has assisted in the past to make this thing happen. Uh, we've already communicated with the author and screenwriter of the movie Red Tails, uh, John um, um, Ridley, uh, who, who put that movie together. And so we're making all efforts now I was just in Washington this past week. I put a copy of this book and the packet you have in front of your hands into the hands of Walter William, or on Walter Williams' desk. He's a regular contributor to PNJ. He writes the Monday column. And he's always talking about African Americans and the lack of education. And, and he's promoting this issue. And I'm hoping that these people will come on board with us also. Thank you very Thank you. much. I, Commissioner Cole. Mr. Chairman, I don't know that it needs to be an agenda item that we could bring it up for discussion. I, uh, not, having not heard from any other group that wants to do this and seeing that the, there's a need and a, and a pretty well organized and defined uh, movement for this, uh, I'd be willing to take a look at this pretty quickly and, and uh, support the idea. Is there any other commissioner that would support uh, having staff put it together before Thursday's meeting or would they prefer to wait till? I, I feel like... Um, it's looking like the consensus is we could add it to our agenda uh, in two weeks, and that would give staff time to, uh, you know, shore up the resolution and the verbiage and what, what we needed to say, and then we could bring it back to the board for a vote at that time. I didn't, I didn't mean to. No, okay. So I think we can get it on the agenda for two weeks, and that way we'll have uh, the language, and, and they can coordinate with you on making sure that language is adequate. I provided a copy of the resolution Pensacola passed, so you have some language. Thank you. Commissioner Salter. Mr. Chairman, I would <clears throat> encourage Chris to try to communicate with the city of Gulf Breeze because I'd hate to do something that they didn't support as well. So I would encourage you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. I, uh, I kept count. We had eight people for public forum, and uh, I just say that it, I think us moving public forum to the beginning has, has been uh, exceptional at the goal, which is, is here in input. We're going to go ahead and move forward because I know we've got a few people, uh, some of which I've asked to be here for the Economic Development Committee. Um, I did want to give an update. Uh, Commissioner Peach is still stuck in traffic, so he is trying to be here to, to do his civil duty. Uh, we've got a couple items on the agenda that we're going to hold until he gets here per his request. Um, but I would like at this time to have uh, Commissioner Salter uh, take up the Economic Development Committee, and that way we can I uh, get the few people that are here waiting on that issue. Mr. Excellent. Chairman, um, just for the sake of some people who spoke during public forum, I'd like to uh, correct a, a, a typo in the engineer's report. The aforementioned Bradley Estates, 
is is incorrectly titled in the action needed. That is Forest Bay Estates. And thank you, sir. We're, we're talking about the engineering item here. It says Forest Bay Estates preliminary plat. That is correct, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Roger. I guess... Uh, Okay, I, I see here, there in the verbiage. I, I got you. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Salter. Uh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Under economic development, we have one item, the Strive Grant Program. <clears throat> Discussion of approval to implement a grant program for signage and vacate improvements for small businesses located in Santa Rosa County. Erica. Good morning. On behalf of Shannon and the Economic Development Department, we're excited to bring this, the framework, uh, the draft framework for this program. Uh, the Strive Grant Program is intended to assist small business owners in the county um, with facade improvements or signage improvements. And this program is modeled after many other programs across the country in cities, counties, states even, um, to support small businesses. So this is a model that's been tested time and time again over the years throughout the country. Um, the purpose is to upgrade the appearance of property, to increase property value, and to stimulate economic activity within the county. Uh, one thing that's really neat about this program is that it not only provides assistance to small business owners, but it also has the potential to increase revenues for the county. Um, some areas actually um, track the um, increases in property tax collections. These improvements increase the value of the property and therefore have the potential to also increase um, property tax revenues to the county. Um, we propose uh, operating this on a reimbursement basis, which means that property owners would submit an application to the County um, for proposed improvements that fall within the framework provided in the application. Once the improvements are complete, um, that business owner would submit the appropriate documentation proving that the funds were expended properly and they would then be reimbursed for their expenditures. Um, for both the signage improvements and the facade improvements, we're proposing a 50% match, which means that the uh, business owner would have to uh, contribute 50% of the total project cost and the county would step in with the remaining 50%. Um, we're proposing um, a funding level of $50,000, which would come from electric franchise fees um, for the first year uh, of this program. And we propose that after the first year that we evaluate uh, the success of the program and then potentially um, discuss moving forward with a second year of funding. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, Mr. Chairman? Commissioner Lynchard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Erica. Uh, I spoke with Shannon about this uh, earlier. I, th I think it's a, it's a great program, uh, a lot of potential there. I would like to see us address uh, some type of clawback provision. If someone were to receive a grant for facade improvement for $5,000 and then sell the property within 24 months, I would like to see a, a requirement that they reimburse the, the grant, uh, if 24 months is appropriate, maybe 36. Certainly. Just so somebody's not using it to fix up their property to sell. Absolutely. Um, but other than that, I, I think this is a, a great framework for uh, getting some things done that, that we get requests for all the time. Yeah. Um, certainly along Highway 98, people ask, you know, what's going on with that storefront that's hasn't changed in 30 years and mm -hmm. a little run down. This is an opportunity for some of those property owners to get in there and, and give them a little incentive to uh, uh, rehabilitate the property. So I support it. Thank you. Mr. Cole. Thank you. Well, I talked to Shannon earlier today. I, being a business owner, I was not in support of government handout to, to small businesses. Uh, but having heard the 50-50, uh, we didn't have much time to really get in depth in it. I'm a little more comfortable with it. I like Commissioner uh, Lynchard's idea of the clawback. Uh, 24 months, I believe, would be a minimum, perhaps a little longer. Uh, good point because, yeah, if I was going to sell my business and had ability to get, you know, the Scambia County to kick in half of what it took to repaint it and up the price, you know, I'd be right there too. So, uh, the I would like to see some of the criteria that's going to allow it. I mean, if somebody's got a nice business already and they just want to upgrade 
are we going to allow that? Or are we looking for places that really need a paint job? I mean, is there going to be a criteria there to, to say that, you know, some level of criteria uh, uh, that would say, okay, this is a good idea rather than you're just, you know, raising the bar type thing on your business. And maybe I'm not explaining it right, but uh, I think maybe catch on what I'm looking for. And, uh, and, and I want to see more of what you mentioned on the tax increases. Uh, I just don't see how a paint job or something would escalate the value of a piece of property to a degree where uh, Greg would get out there and reappraise it uh, and, and be an attribute to the <coughs> county income from that. So if I could see a few things like that, I'm, I'm in support of the concept but uh, and I want to see us move forward on it, but I'd like to see, it, see a little more outline of it. So. Absolutely. I can, I'd be happy to compile that information for you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I spoke to Shannon over the weekend on this, and I support it. So I'm going to recommend moving this to Thursday's consent agenda without objection. Uh, that'll move it. Just before you move it, I, I would be remiss not to say um, a huge token of appreciation, not only to Erica since she's been there and Shannon for his work, but also, uh, you know, we even have the ladies in attendance, the CEOs of some of our largest chambers in the county, uh, Chambers of Commerce, Kristen Rhodes and Donna, as well as Tamara Fountain, um, were instrumental in helping staff, or at least myself, with uh, sort of some of the ideas. And I know y'all work day in and day out to help the business community. Um, and, and I'm excited about this as well. I, I know our local business owners, uh, we're really looking forward to seeing some investment there and not just in, in what they see with the uh, industrial part. So thank you all very much for what you do. And uh, we'll move that to Thursday's consent agenda. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you, Commissioner Salter. Next, we're moving on to the administrative committee. <clears throat> the uh, event request, I just want to ask, uh, real quick here is there anybody uh and, and a show of hands would be fine that is here uh in regards to agenda item number one event request for an item that is not in the navarre area could you just raise your hand if so i wanted to make sure we dealt with that okay i don't i don't see any the um i will ask for privilege to move this uh table this till commissioner peach could get here he has uh, sent a message that he is on his way and made that request that we could hold those for him to be here. So we'll do that. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, if you will, just come forward and state your name and address. And uh, if, it, if it is an item that's not in that district, we'll be glad to dispose of it. Actually, it is in that, uh, it is in that district. Uh, okay. It is in that district. Brian Williams. Um, 2140 Cayuta Castellar in Navarre. Okay. And I'm here representing the Emerald Coast Amateur Radio uh, Association's request to use the Navarre Beach area for field day activity. And this is something y'all have done annually, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. We did. We do this every year. Uh, normally it's in uh, the summer around June. Right. Uh, this year there's an opportunity to do a winter field day activity. And this is in uh, kind of in um, lockstep with uh, practice in some emergency communications, especially after Hurricane Michael and some of the things that we saw fan out from that. Um, so we are going to get out there and actually do some training. We'll be working on a 24-hour exercise there in association with uh, the Santa Rosa County EOC and using one of their trailers there uh, to establish emergency communications not only in the state but within all 50 states. It, do, would your schedule allow uh, shortly wait for him to be here or do you sure. need us to I'll wait I, can, I don't I can want to be discourteous I just wanted to give him the, uh, the respect of he asked that if I could wait on a few of these absolutely and he was there he came out actually last year for our field day okay. so that's fine I'll I'll let it cook all right we won't, we won't let if you get to a point where your schedule you got to leave if you just give me a nod or okay. something we'll, no thank, problem thank, thank you, you very much <clears throat> we're going to move uh, item number two as well we're just going to table briefly uh, that issue is not only in Commissioner Peach's district, but he is also our representative for the board on our Tourist Development Council, and that deals with a Tourist Development Council recommendation. Um, just put this so I don't forget. Item number three is surplus property items. Uh, this is just a declaration as surplus property items from the Santa Rosa 
County Property Appraiser's Office as recommended by the Clerk of Courts. Uh, this is normal procedure. I would recommend moving this to Thursday's consent agenda unless anybody else had uh, anything to say on it. We'll move that to Thursday's consent agenda, seeing no objection. Item number four is a discussion of approval to transfer three ATVs used by the lifeguards to Navarre Beach Fire Department for the provisions of lifeguard services. This board recently approved uh, Navarre Beach Fire Department is going to take over uh, the duties of the lifeguards. And so I would recommend, if I don't see any comment from the board, that to move to Thursday's consent agenda. Number five is the uh, Florida Resilient Coastlines Program, and this is a planning grant opportunity. I believe we have Sheila here to speak on this, maybe? All right, yeah. I always love to hear from Sheila. This, uh, it is amazing, uh, the schedule she juggles, and, and recently uh, this lady, through the help of staff, uh, was able to secure, I believe, about a half million dollars worth of grants for, for uh, two of the parks in our county. So we appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Just a comment. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, but um, the agenda item was a two-part agenda item, and um, there has been a change since the agenda was due. That second component, which was a resiliency um, index and study and public opportunity, we're actually going to pull that off. It's um, We're going to seek some other opportunities for that. It, uh, after we did the agenda item, after some additional consultation with the grantor, we've decided just to submit the Florida Town um, request. So the second component can come off of that. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions from any of the commissioners? Seeing none, we'll move that to Thursday's consent agenda. Thank you, Sheila, so much. Item number six is the. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna table that as well. Commissioner Peach may even be listening by his phone. We're stacking his plate up here when he gets here. All right. Uh, item number seven, discussion of contract, uh, scope of services and fees, and Mott McDonald is program manager for the design and construction of the Santa Rosa County Judicial Center Complex. Uh, do any commissioners have any questions on that item? If not, we'll move that to Thursday's consent agenda. Item number eight, uh, I'm going to ask Commissioner Salter to speak on this, and uh, this is for a road designation for Major Stephen W. Pless. Commissioner Salter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'm glad we have a good turnout today because this is an extremely important uh, resolution that I'm getting ready to read. It's kind of lengthy, so bear with me, and I want you to listen to what this American hero did. This is a resolution of the Board of County Commissioners of Santa Rosa County, Florida, designating a 7,355-foot long road that runs east of Ardfield Road as a Major Stephen W. Pless Medal of Honor Road. Keep in mind, on January the 30th this, this year, we're going to name this road after this hero. It goes into the new Navy outlying field up in Shamukla. This is the one that's it's a swap from Escambia County to, to Santa Rosa, so we're very excited about that. But that kind of gives you a little background on what we're doing. Whereas Stephen W. Pless was born on September the 6th, 1939 in Newman, Georgia, and entered into the United States Marine Corps in Atlanta, Georgia, and was assigned to the 1st Marine Aircraft Wing, United States Marine Corps. Whereas during an escort mission, Major Pless monitored an emergency call that four American soldiers stranded on a nearby beach were being overwhelmed by a large Viet Cong force, Vietnam. Whereas Major Pless flew to the scene and found 30 to 50 enemy soldiers in the open of which some of the enemy were bayoneting and beating down the Americans. Whereas Major Pless displayed exceptional airmanship as he launched a devastating attack against the enemy force, killing or wounding many of the enemy and driving the remainder back into the tree line. Whereas his rocket and machine gun attacks were made at such low levels that the aircraft flew through debris created by explosions from its rockets. Whereas seeing one of the wounded soldiers jesting for assistance he maneuvered his helicopter into a position between the wounded men and the enemy, providing a shield which permitted his crew to retrieve the wounded. 
Whereas during the rescue, the enemy directed intense fire at the helicopter and rushed the aircraft again and again, closing to within a few feet before be being beaten back. Whereas when the wounded men were aboard, Major Pless maneuvered the helicopter out to sea. But before it became safely airborne, the overloaded aircraft settled four times into the water. And after displaying superb airmanship, Major Pless finally got the helicopter aloft. Whereas Major Pless, ex Pless extraordinary uh, heroism coupled with his outstanding flying skill prevented the uh, inhibition of the tiny force, his cur courageous actions reflect great credit upon himself and, up and uphold the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and the U.S. Naval Service. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of County Commissioners of Santa Rosa County, Florida, as follows. Section 1. The recitals are true and correct and incorporated herein, herein by this uh, reference. Section 2, designation of Board of County Commissioners of Santa Rosa County, Florida, hereby endorses the designation of a 7,355 foot long road that runs east of Artfield uh, Church Road as Major Stephen W. Pless Medal of Honor Way. Effective date, the resolution shall take immediate Immediately upon adoption, it's going to be passed and approved, uh, passed and adopted this 24th day of January 2019 by a vote of hopefully four to zero. Uh, and it'll be signed by our chairman, uh, Sam Parker. Here again, th this man was willing to die to save these soldiers. And what a courageous American hero it is, and we're honored to name the, name the new road after him. So any comments or questions? Mr. Chairman, I would move this to the consent uh, agenda on Thursday without objection. We'll move that item without objection. Sir, please, you can come forward. If you would, just state your... About Major Pless. I met him at public development. Well, at Douglas Allen, uh, I sold him uniforms, uh, and I heard what has just been read to you by uh, Mr. Salter from him personally. Um, he was an outstanding man. He came into the building in faded Levi's and a white T-shirt and started looking at miniature medals and telling me which ones he needed. And he went all the way up to the Navy Cross and the Medal of Honor these were ribbons, too. He says, and, I, and I, might, I might need the Medal of Honor. And then he explained to me what he did. You know, I thought this guy was some drunk that'd come off Palafox, you know, but he, because he had a little beard and everything. And, but the, the funny thing was that he was a Mustang. He came up through the ranks. He had paratrooper wings, and he had flight wings. Uh, they made him choose between the flight or the parachute wings because he couldn't wear both at the time. Uh, there was so much grapefruit on him, he could hardly put it on his uniform. Uh, and he brought the Medal of Honor into me uh, when he received it. And he is uh, an American hero. Thank you, Elton. And I forgot to say uh, another important uh, fact is that the co pilot on this flight, Major Fairchild, he lives here in Milton. And he will be attending the road designation as well. But we're, we're honored to have him as well. And he's a Silver Star recipient. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Salter, for that. <clears throat> Item number nine is the uh, Main Street Milton Board appointment. This is a discussion per the request of Main Street Milton uh, for Santa Rosa County appointment as an ex officio member to the Main Street Milton Board as requested by Main Street Milton Executive Director I know in their request they had stated that they would love to have Commissioner Cole. Uh, Commissioner Cole, do you have any problem with that? Or I'll I'll serve on, as a as that member and, and see you know, how the organization is structured and possibly later have a designee for that. But initially, okay. I'll I'll work on it. All right, thank you, sir. All right, we'll move that to uh, Thursday's consent agenda. If there's no objection. 
Item number 10 is a land and water conservation fund grant opportunity. Uh, this is discussion of a proposed grant application for Baghdad Mill Site Park uh, through fiscal year 18 and 19 land and water conservation fund opportunity. Uh, this is another one uh, that Sheila has been very helpful with. I think Dan may have mentioned it to the commissioners. If nobody has any questions, we'll move that to Thursday's consent agenda. And that item is moved. Uh, next, we'll go to Roger and the engineer's report. Yes, item number one is the discussion of the preliminary plat for Forest Bay Estates, a 284-lot subdivision located in District 5. And this uh, subdivision will have a low pressure sanitary sewer system thank you roger and, and just for clarification for the folks here we um this board has directed our staff uh in conjunction with the planning and zoning board as well as any citizen input uh, i mean that is from any citizen or organization uh, and i know y'all have been here before a, a few of you but we are undergoing a comprehensive review and reform of, of places needed for our land development code but i believe and roy our attorney will correct me if i'm wrong that currently the land development code uh, before we can get those processes to change which are you know some of the things of the zoning board back to us and reviewed by the state and, and so it's not a, a one-month process but until then i believe in royal correct me if i'm wrong we cannot legally basically without as you had mentioned in a, in a different reference a burt harris claim deny this uh plat and that always is it is not by any means that it's fallen on deaf ears that we're not concerned I've heard every member up here support us doing a review and revisions to some uh, areas in our land development code. And I, and I think part of that has been spurred directly by your efforts. So please don't take it as deaf ears, but uh, we also don't want to encumber the county in a very expensive lawsuit that we know we would likely lose uh, since this does meet all the requirements. So uh, he hasn't corrected me yet, so I'm going to say that I'm on the right track. And we'll move this to Thursday's consent agenda if there's... Uh, no Sam, uh, I, Commissioner Lynch. I just want to echo everything you said. I think you, you hit the nail on the head. This is a mis ministerial <coughs> act for us. We don't have the discretion to deny uh, an application for a plat when they've met all of the requirements that exist in our land development code. Uh, we are undergoing a revision uh, and review of our entire land development code. Um, that's going to that's a process it's not an event so it's going to go on over the the next uh, number of months and we're going to make changes to our land development code based upon the concerns that that uh, you've raised since October November um, and hopefully at the other end of that we'll have uh, a, a positive outcome in our land development code and, and some of the concerns that, that you've raised we'll be able to deal with on future developments Thank you, Commissioner Lynch. Uh, well, hang on. Commissioner Peach, I saw has got his light on here. So we were going to give you a second to catch your breath. I'll, I'll work it out, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I appreciate your indulgence and my fellow commissioners' indulgence. I appreciate the public's indulgence. Two and a half hour commute. I hadn't had one of those since I was at the Pentagon, so I apologize for the delay in getting here. Um, I understand the no discretion to deny this and, and with the Land Development Code. Um, I'm going to get with Mr. Blaylock, though, just for my newness and edification, because there's some, some concerns for me for access and things like that. And, you know, the plot is there, but I want to make sure we're looking at it from our part to, in order to support this with proper ingress, egress, traffic, and we're in the loop on that. Would, would you like me to keep that on the regular agenda? for Thursday it, if it's not a problem I, yeah. I had some questions for mr. play like I didn't get a chance to get here early enough I no, no problem at all we okay. will uh, we'll keep it on the regular agenda Commissioner Cole thanks sir thank you and I'm gonna echo what Commissioner Peach said I know the legalities of it but there was a lot of uh, things voiced earlier uh, inadequacies that were indicated you know in, in wetlands research and drainage and different <laughs> things like that Roger once this moves from the a discussion of a preliminary plat it doesn't say approval of a preliminary plat it says discussion so we're once we move this on thursday what does your department look at at that point 
the uh, Board of County Commissioners usually discuss these issues in a Monday meeting. I can add some of the information that Commissioner Peach was asking about. Uh, and the people are correct. There are wetlands involved in that total uh, development. The write-up that we receive from the engineer of record says that they're going to avoid those wetlands. Uh, the stormwater design is a 100-year design that we talked about. However, they're going to attenuate and only be able to release to the 10-year, which is an even more extreme situation uh, due to uh, issues within that area. They have said they're going to uh, meet uh, the water quality and quality and utilize wet detention ponds that ultimately will discharge to the wetlands, but they will be treated prior to release. Um, and that's some additional information that brought up from the discussion. Okay. Early How, on. However, there's no additional review on our part unless something is asked of us by the Board of County Commissioners. Because at the time we present this on Monday as a discussion and then a recommendation to go to either the consent agenda or regular agenda, it is our opinion that they meet our current requirements. Okay. Some of the criteria in wetlands is not only wet ground, but also the flora and fauna. Do, do, does our engineering department look at that, or does that have to be done, done by EPA? Well, the developer is responsible for a wetlands delineation on any area that we suspect there are wetlands. They've done that. I don't have the name of the, um, in the write-up who performed that, but it is shown on the backup in your handout, those delineated wetlands that they're avoiding. So uh, okay. you can see that, I think, in the second page of the handout. Now, okay, so, so that person that, the engineer that set up that delineation, he's responsible? To, to, to have the field work done and also have his surveyor come back and survey those actually, uh, the, the wetlands delineation line. Right. Is there any, anywhere along this chain of events since, you know, I can understand if you're in uplands, but since it is in wetlands, is there anywhere along this course of developing this estate or this Plat that they are required to bring the EPA in or the Army Corps in to the Army Corps of Engineers and the and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection both have definition of wetlands. That wetland science individual, the biologist uh, and species person, has to delineate those lines on the plat according to their professional opinion, and it is provided as a part of the preliminary plat signed and sealed by the engineer of record. So the answer is, while they may not specifically bring them out in the field, they certainly have to meet their requirements, just as they have to meet Santa Rosa County's requirements without having us actually go out in the field with them. Okay. And, and I'm, I'm going into this because these folks have taken the time to do, do a lot of research and come to this board and ask questions and point things out. But I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure that the rules are followed. If this moves forward, then uh, you know mistakes shouldn't be happening, and wetland shouldn't be getting filled by, oops, we we made a mistake type thing. And I, I think we're seeing a little more of that recently in some of these situations. So I want to try to curtail that poor excuse anytime we can. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Move that item to Thursday's regular agenda for further discussion. Item number two is, or, sorry, Roger, I was about to steal you under. That, that's fine. Item number two is a discussion of an execution of a local agency program, also known as a LAP agreement, with a resolution for the construction of the Hamilton Bridge uh, Road sidewalks and authorize the chairman to sign all relevant documents. One of the things we want to talk about here in this meeting is the physical impacts. This is a very old DOT work program project. The estimated total estimated cost was 465,000. However, LAP is only going to fund it at 152,000 level. So we have a remaining obligation of 272,000 uh, dollars. Staff proposes that we will segregate the uh, construction plans. We'll bid it in two parts, such that if DOT is willing, we can uh, build a portion of it, possibly within budget or slightly over. But also. 
Uh, the CEI, which is this construction engineering inspection, must be done by a third party per lap requirements, and it too is underfunded by approximately uh, $45,000. So what we propose to do is bid the project in, in, in segments and award what we can, and the board can make a determination whether to go ahead and fund it at different level, additional levels out of the, uh, the aforementioned uh, funds that we described. That's the LOST, possible recreation, or road and bridge reserves. Dan. Sir, I just, uh, I, the local option sales tax uh, programming, the, those funds are, are pretty much 100% programmed to make that decision. We would have to, to reprogram or reprioritize in the transportation and drainage area. Um, there is funding in the recreation area. Um, I don't know if, if the board feels that sidewalks would fit into that recreation area, but uh, road and bridge and reserves is also an option, and, and there is, um, Jane's probably going to kick me under the podium, but there is uh, unassigned fund balance also as an option. We would just ask the board to, to appropriate, uh, or, or uh, if the board desires to appropriate those additional funds, and then we would bid the, the uh, project and uh, come back with uh, the, the final costs. The, uh, the proposed here on, on page two of the backup, where it's got the estimated cost and then the funding with the lap grant is going to give $152,038 and then district one rec fund 10,000 area two impact 30,000 what you're asking us is to let you know on the remaining fund the 272,962 yes sir that and also the uh, CEI additional cost of 45,014 so the total additional Obligate fund, okay. funds for obligation is 317,976 based upon the current construction estimates. Commissioner Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Roger, I know we've, we've had this discussion on other projects, but the fact that this is a lap project, could we do this cheaper if it were not a lap project? But by cheaper, you mean do it with in-house labor forces? With, no. or, or contracted. But just no, not I, I don't believe we will contract it any less. The only, the only savings in the contract will be the CEI associated with it, that $45,000. Okay. Uh, we bid it according to the plans and specs that we, we are, have developed. Uh, would anticipate the construction would be at or near that engineer's estimate. Uh, the cost savings come in not having to meet all of the uh, federal Davis Bacon and those sorts of things. Howsomever, we've already taken money from DOT for the in-house design associated with this. I think this one's pretty much committed. This is a lap project. Thank you. Any other members have any? I do. Mr. Cole? I'd, I'd like to keep this on the regular agenda till Thursday and talk about it a little more. I think Mr. Lyncher was hitting it where I was hitting it. If, how much have we spent on design? I mean, can we pay? We can pay back the state if there's enough of a savings there. Uh, pay the state back and still save money. But, uh, quite possibly. Half a million dollars for sidewalks is a, is a pretty good lick. We I, would, I know they're great. Everybody loves them. But we'll go back through and talk with the uh, lap coordinator in District <laughs> Three, Chipley. But I certainly would be uh, very hesitant to recommend that path without having that discussion because I certainly wouldn't want to jeopardize sure. a number of other lap projects that we have in, in the works. But we don't disagree that lap is not a good way to deliver sidewalk projects. Okay. Howsomever, well, any DOT funding in the future is going to be delivered in that fashion and probably many of our resurfacing programs as well. Well, I'm okay with it as long as they get a little more skin in the game but well long, this is this long. has been the motion in in the initial beginning of the lap program that we were getting 100 percent funding both yeah. for construction design and cei uh, dot has since departed from that uh, policy yeah. so they i assume like everyone else trying to give more local communities opportunities to get some of the federal funding sure i i can appreciate that but i mean they're not even at 50 50 at this point so i'd we may take it, this as a lesson learned, 
you know, as you said, on you know, for sidewalks in the future. But I think it. I'd like for you to come back Thursday with some things if the rest of the board's okay with that. We will do. Um, we'll do. We'll move that to Thursday's regular agenda. Thank you. Item number three is a discussion of a contract with Panhandle grading, Paving and Grading for concrete crushing at Central Landfill. Uh, the Central Landfill uses the crushed material to construct haul roads and, uh, and dump pads uh, in our landfill. Uh, we received two proposals of which they were the less and we're recommending uh, proceeding with the uh, award to Panhandle Grading and Paving at 905 a ton or 11.30 per cubic yard, depending on which is less expensive. Move that to Thursday's consent agenda. Item number four is a discussion of the engineering scope and fee in the amount of $1,365,167 with an additive design option in the amount of 69552 This is from Volkert. Uh, engineering for the P Ridge connector design, construction inspection, and authorization for the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, you know the history of this project. The board uh, advertised an RFQ and interviewed uh, uh, a number of firms. Uh, based on the interviewed five firms, selected Volkert. The scope of services includes surveying geotechnical, traffic analysis, signal design roadway design and post-construction services. Uh, scope includes 100% design for that two-lane section that was presented by Volkert. In addition, it takes the four-lane section to 60% to ensure that it'll fit within that right-of-way and, and meet all of the drainage requirements. And so the Board of County Commissioners can take that 60% four-lane design all the way to 100 for that additional 69,000. Uh, staff is recommending approval of the agreement. Scope and fee. Commissioner Cole. Thank you. Roger, just real quick, when you say post-construction services? Yes. Uh, CEI, field inspection, okay. pay requests, change orders, anything that happens in that field during that. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, as we just seen, that's quite a bit just on a sidewalk. So for that to be included in this cost is, seems to be a pretty good deal. So. Yes. And if you go into the actual detail of the agreement, you can see that different scope and fee break out by design, permitting, and uh, CEI. Dave understands that. Oh, you're talking to a mechanic. You just have to lay it out for me. So. Okay. <laughs> we'll move, thank you. We'll move that to uh, Thursday's consent agenda. And item number five is a discussion of the construction services. Uh, gentlemen, I handed out uh, the additive uh, information. We received two quotes from two contractors working in the Maranatha Chipper Lane Pond. Uh, we approved the purchase of a 6.3 acre property acquisition from Mr. Robert McClure. We purchased the property with the agreement that we would accept his stormwater. Remember we had an issue which goes first, chicken and egg. Uh, we arrived at as part of the agreement we would accept his stormwater at a point certain. That is shown in the handout, the attachment, and we're recommending approval of the estimate from Roberson Underground Utilities, which is actually the developer's um, contractor, and the amount is $86,424.50 as a low proposer meeting specification. Commissioner Cole. And we're keeping our dirt? Yes. Thank you. Well, no, no, wait a minute. No. There, there's no keeping dirt associated with this change. I thought they were expanding upon it. The, the pond expansion was is describing the additional uh, infrastructure associated with it. The pond is is already expanding under the existing contract. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. All right. That will we'll move that to Thursday's consent agenda, and that will conclude the engineer's report. Thank you, Roger. Uh, now we're going to take a five minute break, and then after that, we will return to the. Uh, three items that we tabled on the administrative agenda.
All right, we're going to call the meeting back to order after that prolonged five-minute break. <laughs> so uh, we're going to go back to the administrative committee. Item number one, I know we've got a few people here in the audience, and uh, this is a discussion of approval of the following event requests. There are six requests there. Uh, Commissioner Peach, do you want to dispose of this item? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you all. Thanks again for the indulgence in that. Um, we have uh, six different event requests here. Um, I'll just read through them all. I, I have, before I read through them all, though, I have talked with staff. Uh, there are concerns about event requests and, and how folks utilize county property and things. So I've been talking with staff a little bit about, uh, you know, and, and Dan's aware, you know, making sure we tighten up that process because there's a lots of folks out there watching. And as I said previously, everything has to be at a level playing field so if we allow folks to use county property we need to ensure we have a mechanism to ensure they comply with all these requirements that we clearly lay out in order to use that in order for our safety and and the people who attend the event safety as well as if they do anything to the property itself that it is returned to its original state if not better so um I think we all got letters and you know I know you're here Jerry um, but just to get it on record you know when we put the property out insurance is required you know if there's liquor being sold there's liquor licenses that need to be attained so we need and I know we don't control the liquor licenses but it is on our property so I'd like to see us have a mechanism to verify things are done uh, as well as you know if we put holes in parking lots we got to make sure we we get them back because as the engineer and me as a maintenance engineer you put a hole in my parking lot I get upset with you because that hurts the parking lot so I've just asked the staff to tighten up that process for all these event requests um, if any of my fellow commissioners have questions on that I'd be happy to okay so we can go through these event requests uh, community life Methodist Church use the right away along Soundside Drive for a 5k Run walk scheduled for March 2nd, 2019 from 7.30 to 9.30. Do you want me to just read through these and no. recommend all of them to the consent? Yeah. Or? I know we've got a couple people here. If you just uh, oh, ask if there's nobody here to speak on them. Okay. Just move them to Is there anyone here to speak on event number one, United Methodist Church? Okay. Uh, number two is the Navarre Chamber Foundation's request to utilize Golf Boulevard in a portion of the boat ramp parking lot. For the 2019 run for the reef scheduled for October 12 2019 from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. is there anyone here that would like to speak on this event seeing none we'll move to number three uh, a request from DJD's marvelous light foundations request to utilize county right away near high school Boulevard for the 5k run walk scheduled for March 30th 2019 from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. yes ma'am come on up please just state your name and address for the record, if you would, please. Good morning. Um, my name is Cheryl Dees, and um, thank you all for allowing me to speak. I actually drove five and a half hours this morning from Jacksonville, Florida, to be before you all. Um, just really quickly here, um, this is my son. His name is Darnell Demetrius Dees, Jr. Um, we are a military family. My husband is active duty. He's a lieutenant in the United States Navy. And my son completed half of his ninth grade year and half of his 10th grade year here in Navarre. And excuse me if I get emotional, but um, I am the president and the founder of the Darnell Dees Jr. Marvelous Light Foundation. Um, on June 14th of last year, my son died by suicide. He was 16 years old. And our foundation focuses on mental health awareness and suicide prevention. Um, we love the city of Navarre. We love Navarre High School. When my son passed, um, Coach Walls and over half of the football team and the entire track team drove five and a half hours to Jacksonville, Florida to attend his funeral. Those who could not make it um, drove two hours to Gulfport, Mississippi for his burial. Again, our foundation focuses on mental health awareness and suicide prevention. He has so many friends, family, and loved ones across the country. And our goal was to make sure that no one, no other family ever had to go through what we went through. We had no signs, no symptoms, nothing from DJ. He was an honor student, and he was getting ready to attend a prestigious boarding school in Jacksonville, Florida called the Bowl School. Um, we go around and we tell DJ's story of trusting the process. And what we are asking um, is that in every city and state that DJ played football in. We want to have a 5K walk 
to um, com commemorate his memory. We also want to give back to the community that gave so much to us. Um, we partnered with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention on December 3rd of last year, um, 2018, and donations that we received from Citizens in Navarre, um, Papa John's, people that we didn't even know, different um, organizations gave us donations and money, and we forwarded them over to the Amer American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So we wanted to do the same thing with DJ's Foundation. Um, we're starting with Navarre High School. We're also doing Monta Vista Christian um, in Watsonville, California, Fleming Island High School in Fleming Island, Florida and then Harrison Central High School in Gulfport, Mississippi. Um, we are offering high school seniors um, who are willing and able and want to to write a simple 500 word essay on how the pressures of society, social media, sports events, things of that nature contribute um, to the pressure of mental health that comes down on them and we are awarding a thousand dollar scholarship. Um, the more funds that we receive the more that we will be able to give out um, and then we're also offering free mental health first aid um, to the community, up to 50 individuals. If we have sponsors, um, of course, they will be priority. Um, but this is just something that we wanted to do, again, to give back to the community that gave so much to us and to spread awareness for mental health and suicide prevention. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you're Ms. McKenna? The I apologize. I yes, Ms. Laura McKenna. Okay. Yeah, okay. so we had her. So she was such a great support. Her and Ms. Erica Schultz and Coach Walls and Coach Carter, the entire um, football again and track staff there, um, you know, have been helping us organize. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear about your loss. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you for your family service. And, and again, my sympathies for your loss. Thank you, um, thank you for being here today. Uh, number four is Baghdad Elementary's request to utilize the green space at Baghdad Park for their 2019 field day scheduled for March 15th and April 17th from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. Anyone like to discuss that? Seeing none. Move to number five, Pirates on the Panhandle Inc.'s request to utilize a portion of the parking lot near the Sand Crab Pavilion on Navarre Beach for the 2020 Pirate Plunge scheduled for January 1st, 2020 from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Mr. Foster. Gentlemen of the board, ladies on the end, good afternoon almost, it seems like. Been on the road, Dave, how many hours? <coughs> Two and a half? <laughs> uh, I'd like to uh, thank the board for uh, past performance on allowing us to uh, hold this event and request, as I did uh, two weeks ago, to allow us to do it again. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, a Typo in our request, however, uh, we'd like to uh, hold the event until 4 o'clock, not 1 o'clock. So it would run from around 11 until about 4, as it did this past January 1st. Uh, this would be our third year uh, doing this event. Without the uh, help of the TDC, we have been extremely successful, especially in uh, gathering people from outside the area, giving them something to do on New Year's Day. And we've been uh, uh, able to give a good donation to a worthy cause in our community because of the event. Uh, I'd like to also set the record straight uh, uh, with Commissioner Peach's comment earlier about uh, selling liquor. Uh, we did not sell liquor. Uh, I inquired with the folks in Tallahassee with regard to acquiring a liquor license and the comment was if you give the liquor away you don't need a liquor license so uh, that's in essence what we were doing that particular day uh, so we felt like if the people in Tallahassee said we didn't need it we didn't secure one uh, if that's a request that you're asking us to do next year uh, and I'll certainly abide by the rules. Uh, the other rule that uh, we always try to leave uh, things better than we found it and I have to confess that this was a situation with regard to the uh, the holes in the uh, pavement. The right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. Uh, we had contracted through an event planner uh, to secure the tent he subcontracted the tent and he thought the tent folks were going to repair it when they took it down and the tent guy thought that the contractor that hired him was going to repair it so that 
work will be done, uh, if not today, tomorrow. Uh, I've been in contact with uh, Sandra Lusk, uh, I don't know, a week, 10 days ago. Uh, the, our current contractor here in Milton was out of town, and uh, he said that he could do it either today or tomorrow. So that was the game plan to, uh, to repair uh, the parking lot. Uh, you know, we're a small group, uh, our pirates on the panhandle, and as you've heard me say in the past, uh, with about 35 people in over nine years, we have raised, donated to other nonprofit organizations over $84,000 of real money that's made a real difference to those organizations. And uh, we would request that you continue to allow us to do what we do to serve our community and, and beautiful Navarre and, uh, and help us help those in need. So I, uh, I request that you uh, allow us to continue and I'll uh, answer any questions that anyone might have. Commissioner Cole. Thank you. Jerry, I appreciate any community group going out and raising funds for our community. It's a, you know, it's, it's just a mark of being an American in the Santa Rosa County folks. I would just suggest you clean up, you know, maybe, I mean, when I look at this, it says cash bar. I mean, a cash Coke bar isn't usually advertised. A cash liquor bar is normally advertised. And then if I'd come into that tent and wanted a beer or a shot of whiskey and didn't buy a wristband for $2, could I have gotten one? And the indication I have is no, you can't. Or what what I've heard is no, you can't. You've got to buy a wristband. So well, it. I mean, I know. don't mean to interrupt, uh, Commissioner Cole. So. However, it's an event to benefit an organization. The, 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 so the, 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 the reality the benefit, is, the everyone benefit, in the tent was supposed to understand. help us. But the benefit help them. doesn't uh, doesn't outweigh the risk that the county's taking. And y'all are taking, quite frankly. So I, I'm, I'm not against it. I'm not going to not vote for it. I'm just saying, you know, you see where, where you're getting picked apart. Just let's clean it up for next year and go on down the road. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, so you're saying anybody's allowed to be in our tent? I mean, that's, that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to raise funds for a benefit. Well, then you need to figure out a way to, to do it. I mean. You know, you're, you're skirting the issue, on, but reality is it's not happening. I mean, if, I, if you're going to say complimentary drinks and I walk in there and want a complimentary drink and can't have one because I did not buy a wristband, then you're just, you know, you're getting around it. That's, that's all I'm saying. I'm not against it. And, and you've already said, you know, you've already straightened out the holes in the parking lot, so yeah, that'll be I'm, taken I'm care of. With that. And we apologize and, on that. And like Again, I say, and then right on your flyer it says cash bar. Well, you know, cash bar means a cash bar. It don't mean a cash coke or sprite. I, or I'm not sure drink. which flyer you're you're right replying there. to. So, Jerry, as you come up, really just in the essence of. Yeah. Okay. So that we can, so six. that we can move, keep the agenda moving forward, uh, as Commissioner Peach did before. Our staff will, will make sure that they work with you. They're going to tighten up. <clears throat> Not a way we do know what the left and right hand are doing. So if you'll just coordinate with staff as normal and Roy, I think will, will weigh in during that process on any legality questions you have concerning events, and we'll get that moving forward. But I, I just want to keep the agenda moving. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I, I have no problem approving the event, and Jerry, it's not picking on just your organization. Like I say, it's got to be a level playing field for everyone, and I'm a lessons implemented guy, not just a lessons learned guy. So we learned some lessons from this one. We're going to implement the changes, and we're going to hold we're, everyone. We're going to try to do it bigger and better, and uh, and we'll try to follow the guidelines set forth. All right. Thank yep. you. That'll be on Thursday. Yep. It in. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. We appreciate your support. Uh, number six is the Emerald Coast Amateur Radio Association's request to utilize county property on Navarre Beach for their amateur radio field day scheduled for January 26, 27, 2019 from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. I know you're here. I was listening to you in the car on the way up here, so go ahead. Hey, good morning again, uh, Commissioners. Thank you for your time. Uh, Brian Williams, 2140 Calle de Castellar in Navarre, Florida. Um, I'm representing the Emerald Coast uh, Amateur Radio 
association and what we intend to do is have a 24-hour exercise in that area um, that's adjacent to the uh, maintenance facility on Navarra Beach in the Marine um, Park area. Uh, we did this last year. We've done it um, the year before. Normally we do it in June during the summer. Um, however, um, what we've had an influx of members in our organization, uh, especially after some of the things that happened after Hurricane Michael. And what we're trying to do is to train up a lot of the people in our organization. At the same time, this is an event that's open to the community. They can come out and uh, actually participate and see emergency communications going on um, uh, throughout the night. We'll have opportunities for folks to walk through um, our trailer, which is um, a trailer we're using in cooperation with the Santa Rosa County uh, EOC. So that will be on board. We'll be all on uh, generator power, emergency power for the duration of the event. So we won't be using any kind of other county resources or anything like that. But we will have the opportunity for folks to come through and walk through and um, observe what we're doing there. So it's a good opportunity for us to set up in field conditions and to practice uh, some of these things um, just in case we need to do it for real. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank and I, you. my wife and I did enjoy that event, and I encourage the community to get out and see this because we actually made contact with South Texas and South Florida, and, and with recent events. And Michael, you're exactly right. It's it's an art that these gentlemen and, and ladies pull off out there. So if you get a chance, go see it. But thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, so I'd recommend we move all six of these events to uh, Thursday's consent agenda. So moved. Uh, you want to handle item number two? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Emerald Coast Wildlife Refuge Animal Habitats, discussion of approval of funding to construct and build animal habitats for Emerald Coast Wildlife's new facility in Santa Rosa County for a total of up to $117,000. Um, this was brought before the TDC on January 3rd. Um, Mr. Anderson and, uh, and Mitch were there presenting to the TDC uh, requesting funds. Their initial request was for the full uh, 467,000 that we had previously seen um, in order to complete the f two facilities and the animal habitats. Uh, there was much discussion. Yeah, Mr. Anderson's here, sir. Do you want me to bring him up? No, I, I okay. didn't know if Julie was. Or Julie, yeah, Julie will probably speak as well. Um, do you want to intro this then, Julie? I'm sorry. Still learning. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, yes, the TDC received the, the request from the Emerald Coast Wildlife Refuge, and I attached all the backup in this request. Um, the initial request was for 400, 400 something thought, uh, thousand dollars, yeah. And so uh, after a lengthy discussion at the end of the day, what they voted to do was to fund $117,000, and I, I recommend that as well. Um, and they specifically voted to fund this for the wildlife habitat because we went back and forth on building costs versus habitats, whatnot. And so that was their recommendation to me to carry towards you to the board. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Julie. Um, I, I'll bring Mr. Anderson up and, and he can, uh, he wishes to speak on this. Or, and also, yeah, I, I'd like to point out that this would be coming from um, the TDT unallocated funds that we have. Not the 750 set aside for reserves, but the extra up and above that. Thanks. Ms. Shaw over there at the TDT meetings. I meant it. Good morning, Commissioners. Bill Anderson, 8171 Stillwater Cove in Navarre. Uh, gentlemen, I think you have the uh, comprehensive briefing in front of you that we gave to the TDC in the interest of time. I certainly won't go through that with you. But I do need to capture some highlights. You understand what we're doing, I think, better than anybody since we've ha been having these discussions since roughly May of uh, 2018. To uh, summarize, building a medical uh, rehabilitation center, education center, and the habitats that support our relocation to Santa Rosa County. Total uh, project costs of about $609,000, of which $471,808 is unfunded. Those aren't new numbers. Uh, and I'd like to highlight that we have raised 61% of the total project costs, which are in excess of $800,000 to self-fund the completion of this project. So we have certainly been busy to try and get uh, moved here to Santa Rosa County. With that move, we expect to generate revenues 
Uh, this is slide number eight in your package of $120,591 a year. Uh, again, that's self-sustainment uh, operational costs that we realized that our zoo location up in Crestview, which was seven miles to the east of the city on Highway 90, frankly, in the middle of nowhere. So we expect being right there on the major north-south corridor on Highway 87, uh, we will meet those $120,000 a year revenues, if not succeed, exceed them. Our immediate Santa Rosa County impacts to uh, Santa Rosa residents, to uh, tax rolls, et cetera, our current annual budget is $207,325 a year. That would transfer as soon as we get open here in Santa Rosa County, which once we get the buildings constructed, that is going to be immediate. In addition to that, we are in the final negotiation process for the $110,872 federal grant, which would fund two additional full-time employees bringing our total annual uh, impact to Santa Rosa County as an organization of $318,000 per year, including four full-time employees and two part-time employees. Again, that would be as soon as we get moved. So in discussions uh, with the TDC, with uh, Commissioner Peach, with uh, some of you commissioners, it became obvious that the budget just doesn't allow for y'all to support the $471,808 in unfunded construction costs. We understand that. Y'all face fiscal uh, constraints, same as we do. So I have some revised courses of action in front of you that I uh, discussed with the uh, Commissioner Peach. But again, we've already raised 61%. Uh, Commissioner Cole, uh, Chairman Parker, I think uh, either in November, or December, you asked me, are we to a time critical stage in the project right then? We weren't then, we are now. And we desperately need your help to get this project across the finish line so we can get moved and uh, sustain ourselves. The structural, uh, the foundations are all poured on both buildings. The structural steel is up on both buildings. They are doing the skins on both buildings as we speak. Now it's going to become a matter of the additional funding for us to get those buildings complete, especially the Medical Rehabilitation Center, which is the requirement for us to get moved here to Santa Rosa County. So this was the uh, t slide title course of action number three. You see now uh, three codes disregarding what is printed on that slide. And if I may walk you through those, please, they will not show up on the slide itself. They will be in the handwritten notes that I believe uh, this young lady made copies of for you. Do you have those in front of you? Okay. The first is there has been discussion about uh, the TDC's recommendation to you, the commissioners, of 117,000 being duplicated next year for a total of $234,000. My request there would be because we have construction uh, underway, because we are in a critical phase, if you could consider moving those funds forward to fund both years or the $234,000 now, that would allow us to uh, close the delta between the $354,808. It will take us to complete those buildings. We feel that we can raise uh, the money between the 234 if you were to grant that and that 354 to get those buildings both completed for us to get moved to Santa Rosa County and get fully operational. That would include the 117,000 obviously already recommended to you by the uh, Tourist Development Council. Secondly, $194,000. Uh, one of the uh, very well respected nonprofits here in Santa Rosa County received $200,000 in infrastructure funding in 2014. So we would be asking for a similar uh, Commissioner Peace used the term at the uh, TDC meeting, we don't need a handout, we need a hand up. That's where we're at with our project. So if you would take that $200,000 uh, figure that there is already precedence for y'all funding, minus off the $6,000 that the TDC has already granted the Emerald Coast Wildlife Refuge, and grant us the $194,000 if the two hundred and forty. $34,000 is not affordable. That would allow us to complete the medical center, get moved to Santa Rosa County, 
uh, start injecting that $300,000 into Santa Rosa and start earning our own revenues uh, as discussed previously. Both of those assume that, and this is our, uh, our ask, the 117,000 recommended to you by the Tourist Development Council was for habitats. And it was a very gracious recommendation. But I didn't feel the TDC really had the depth of knowledge on this subject matter, with the exception of Commissioner Peach, myself, and uh, Mrs. White, that you all certainly have about uh, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and why it is now so time critical. I don't think any of these numbers are new to you, except for the pared down figures I just ran by you. So, I think, personal opinion, it appeared that the TDC took the $117,000 of outstanding habitat costs, and that was the number that was most affordable from their perspective. If we are restricted to applying that $117,000 to habitats as opposed to construction costs of the buildings, A, it will halt construction. But secondly, frankly, uh, gentlemen, habitats are much easier for us to get funded through either corporate or individual sponsorships since it's smaller chunks of money, anywhere from $2,000 uh, to $65,000. That's our largest habitat. So if you will, at a minimum, allow us to reroll that $117,000 towards completion of the buildings, that would be uh, most appreciated. So in summary, uh, three options for your consideration, 234,000, 194,000, of which there's precedent for. Both of those allow us to get moved immediately, or the 117,000 uh, recommended by the TDC, which, uh, frankly, we think will result in a halt of construction based upon funding. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Peach, I'd, I'd love to hear you weigh in on this since you're our uh, member on the TDC. I, I certainly, certainly will, sir. Uh, is there anyone else here that wants to speak on this? Because, Julie, I'm going to ask you to come back up, too, for some clarification. Jerry, you want to speak on this? If I may. Sure. Again, gentlemen, ladies on the end, uh, I wear a couple of hats today. Uh, and I'll, I'll start with our Pirates on the Panhandle, since you're familiar with me with that. Uh, we support the wildlife uh, refuge, uh, needless to say, and we had last year donated three thousand uh, dollars for a habitat. So I, I think uh, Bill is a hundred percent correct in his assessment that community people can come forward and help in that area, and where he really needs help uh, is with the building. And the other hat I wear is I'm very proud to say that six years ago I uh, helped start the Keller Williams Realty Office in Navarre with four other young ladies, and today we have over 100 agents. Last May, 40 of those agents spent one entire day clearing land, building habitats. We came back several weekends, Saturday and Sundays, uh, at least 30 of us uh, continued to work for the rest of the, the month of May and on into June to assist in building habitats. That's the easy portion of it that helps the animals in their natural environment. And I think what, what really is needed today, just as a, as a citizen of the community, is for you to consider helping them move physically into the county and assist them with their request uh, for substantial amount of funds to complete the building that's currently under construction. Uh, I thank you for allowing me uh, time to come forward again and speak on uh, this behalf, and I'll answer any questions you may have. Hearing none, I'll uh, thank say, you, Jerry. I'll say thank you. Yep. So yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, fellow commissioners, in the discussion of the TDC, um, they were looking and asking Mr. Anderson what he needs to be operational. You know, what would his minimum amount be to become operational? and get his operations here in Santa Rosa County. Um, he presented all these similar options, and, and as he stated, you know, the 117 seemed palatable since it was coming, you know, out of, uh, out of cycle request out of TDC reserves. And correct me if I'm wrong, Julie, please jump in any time. But, uh, um, and they cho we chose the habitats as, as the TDC and to move that forward. Since talking with Mr. Anderson, and, and we have not gone back to the TDC, which, which I apologize because we only have the meetings once a month, um, 
I am of the favor of providing those funds to him on contingent that he gets operational and not restrict him to just the habitats. I believe he wants to get that medical facility done, which is the key to his operation. Um, and, and those funds could be spent, you know, either, you know, for habitats or the medical facility, which truly gets him here. If he has the habitats done and no medical facility, he's still not operational. So it's kind of a sticky wicket for me as the new guy, I'll be honest with you that, you know, the TDC specifically said habitats, uh, it is not my intention to just disregard the TDC's recommendation, but I want to ask Julie how she feels, if she feels comfortable that the TDC board would understand this. I know we as the commissioners make the final decision, but. Yeah, um, if you were to go back and watch that meeting, it was a long discussion. I don't think that necessarily uh, three quarters of the way through they even were going to fund anything. And it was a, kind of almost the very last where I said to Bill, I said, Bill, please break it down for us in a separate way. How much is the medical center cost? How much does the education building cost? And how much does the habitats cost? And he broke it down for us and gave us three different figures. And so then I, I turned to them, if I remember correctly, and said, how about we at least, at least fund their habitats for them? I don't think they were wanting to necessarily fund their buildings. Now, the, of course, it's at the will of the board what you all decide to do. Um, this was just the recommendation that I'm bringing to you. And there was a lot of discussion of why and uh, what they've funded in the past versus what they are predicting to fund in the future as far as um, buildings goes and, and stuff like that. There was a lot of a depth to this discussion. Commissioner Cole. Cool. Thank you. Did you have something else? No, I'll, okay. I'll just chime in as you. <clears throat> Hi, Bill. You and your organization have been patient with this, got pulled into this with a <coughs> butterfly house. Thank you, sir. I think it's a great attribute. I've been down there when we cut the ribbon and, and Congressman Gates was there and a few other people. Uh, the 61% you raised, yes, sir. does that include in any way the value of the property that you and your wife donated to this? It does. It does, okay. It does. I just want to get that out yes, clear. Sir, it does. So. Because if it wasn't, it should, certainly should be, I think. And that's what, frankly, a commissioner jumps the project costs up to that million dollar uh, figure, okay. you know, eight, eight and change. Approaching a million is when you All include right. the land value, which, to your point, should be included. I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but I'd be willing to fund the, you know, the $354,000. But I like Commissioner Lynchard's comment earlier. How do we have a clawback on that? How do we assure the citizens of Santa Rosa County if we, and and even if we do this over a two-year period, I think it gives you a, you know, if you had a letter from the county to go to the bank and borrow funding, whatever, you, however you work that out. But I would be willing to commit to that. But I want to know how the citizens of Santa Rosa County are going to be assured that this is, this is going to happen. I mean, I, I've, I've known you for a while. I've known Mitch. I, you know, I feel. Don't go uh, <laughs> I feel this is a good thing, but, you know, I want to, I want the citizens to feel comfortable with it too. Whatever we commit to, that, yes, that this is going to be a true value to our community, and and how does Santa Rosa County protect that three hundred and fifty thousand dollars if we choose to go that route? Sure, I can ask that. Uh, I can answer that question directly. That is the outstanding legal contract amount per the general contractor. So that's what we are still on the hook uh, for him to to complete both of those buildings to when we put the keys in the door. Well, so that is a legally binding contract that we have. I understand, yes, sir. But so if the county would prefer to pay the contractor directly and not have ECWR in the middle of that, you know, if that is a safeguard, uh, certainly. Uh, we have uh, intentionally we have not put ourselves in a position to fail as an organization so we have kept a year's worth of operational reserves so that we can operate get moved and be open for business and build the constituency that we expect on that revenue slide that you saw so that the minute we open the doors we won't be uh, out of business because we don't have any uh, any money in the bank to survive and operate. So I think that should also be a confidence measure for you as the commissioners and the taxpayers to be uh, investing in the Emerald Coast Wildlife Refuge. And then the fact that, frankly, we've been at this since 1994. We'll be celebrating our 25th year of continuous operations. 
in Santa Rosa County as well as the, the four adjacent counties, I think uh, should give you some, uh, some confidence that we're not a fly-by-night organization. Uh, we say what we mean and we do what we say. Well, and, and to me, you have some strong backing with Keller Williams and, and Jerry out there. Uh, Scott Kemp's on your board of directors. Yes, sir. I mean, uh, Scott puts a lot of uh, sweat equity in our county on yes, the boards sir. he sits on. So. Okay. I think also, uh, Commissioner, to your point, you know, over the years in 2013, we were supported by the Impact 100 Ladies of Northwest Florida for a $113,000 grant, I believe it was, and just here in 2018, as you gentlemen know very well, we were again selected this time by Impact 100 uh, Pensacola Bay Area for a $100,300 grant, which is roughly half the cost of that education, which clearly trimmed the numbers down some that I'm uh, coming to you needing help with. If you're familiar at all with those ladies' vetting process, it is extensive, and they're very professional, very thorough what they do. I believe we had to submit at final count 155 pages of documentation as to why uh, we merited the investment of Impact 100 and what we were trying to do in this project. Okay. Well, board knows how I feel, so we'll see where we go. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Salter. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, Bill, I appreciate everything y'all have done. I support your project. My question is to Commissioner Peach. You were talking about funding the operational startup of, of the project. You have a number on that? Bill, correct me if I'm wrong. To get the buildings done in the habitat, the total number you supplied to us was, I believe, 467? Yes, sir. Uh, let me back up a number of slides. The uh, buildings themselves? Is well, no, the total you asked the TDC yeah. for was 467. Four. They've agreed to give 117 Correct. to the habitats, which would leave public math about 350. It's 354,808 for the completed construction the, cost of the two buildings. The two facilities to yes, be 100% operational. Yes, sir. Like you will get a 100% full up and running uh, Emerald Coast Wildlife Refuge. And what I mean by that is uh, even currently at our uh, site in Okaloosa, uh, county, we don't have a 100 foot by 20 foot by 16 foot high large raptor rehabilitation habitat. So we have to ship those bald eagles, owls, ospreys, vultures, the big raptors up to Alabama for that final uh, stage of flight training prior to their release. That's a requirement by, by United States Fish and Wildlife. So uh, to fund all of that 470 roughly that would even include the large flight cage habitat. So we would be fully operational. Thank you. Bill. Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner Peach, I, I guess maybe now I'm going to ask you for my clarification. I had understood your comment about re rolling the TDC's recommendation, but uh, were you recommending us fund to that 300 and something thousand or just allow that the funding that the TDC had recommended to be used towards the basically their greatest need? Well, what, what I'd like to see is to be able to get them operational. Now, I don't want to go back and say we take all that from the TDC. Um, if there's other ways that we can help fund this project to get it moving forward. If we can't, I believe the option, there's an option on the table or course action that if we re -out, or if we said the 117 could be used for facilities and there was another 77 we could put on it, you could get the medical facility done. I but the whole cost would be about Three uh, taking the TDC dollars out for the buildings is about three fifty four. You said yes, sir. Three fifty four so, eight oh eight. Yeah, for I'm, I'm just looking for ways to to move them forward. Of course, you know the panacea is we were able to help them get this whole thing done, but that's a large chunk for the TDC to swallow at this time. Truly, is why they were hesitant. If you will indulge me, I, I apologize that I haven't had time to watch the meeting. I heard that it was a quite lengthy meeting. Um, can you brief me on sort of the consensus? And I have the, uh, I had the pleasure, and I appreciate Commissioner uh, Cole uh, allowing me the opportunity to serve on the TDC for a year. Because what I learned is these people are, I mean, they take it uh, just like the zoning board members. They take it very serious. They, they, uh, Julie regularly uh, notifies them of their role is really, you know, they're not the governing body, but obviously they're. They're a role of, of business and industry professionals that help guide us on are these things legal 
but they also make recommendations on what they feel like is the best role for this funding, which is supposed to be to perpetuate tourism and, and grow that base for the local economy. And so I have learned to, to really appreciate their opinions. Can you walk me through, is, it was the consensus, <clears throat> how do they feel about that? Because that, in essence, to me, is the way I look at their recommendation from the conversations I had during that year on the board yeah. of sitting back saying, hey, I'm going to support you guys' recommendation. It, is usually garners around, do we feel that this will grow tourism or not, which was the intent of the bed tax collection, if I remember right. Sure. Well, first, I know that they felt in unison that this is a, a great addition to this county. Um, they stand behind it 100% being in our county. I think that the general consensus from that long conversation was that they didn't know that it was necessarily their role to fund these two buildings bottom line that's the way i took it and if you go back and watch that meeting that's that's pretty much i think what you'll think like i said towards the very end of this discussion i asked that it be broke down because i really just don't think they were going to fund it if if i mean that's the feeling that i was getting as we were correct me if i'm wrong commissioner peach as we were going through this meeting i don't think it was it was going that way in that direction and so I asked if he could please break it down into those three categories, medical building, education, and habitats. Because obviously, and the reason, my reasoning behind that log logically was thinking that the education building didn't have to be there right then, right? So I thought, well, the two things that are more important would be obviously some, uh, somewhere for them to live, a habitat, and their medical research building. And so I, I took those two numbers and the less one was 117,000, the habitat thing, and I, I asked the TDC, how do you feel about this? And then they, they voted unanimously to go that way. That was, in general, the wrap up of, of how that went. I don't know how to better, I hope I'm giving you enough information. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, may May I add, based upon y'all's guide, uh, guidance to us at the December meeting, you said uh, go to the TDC, get there quickly. Let's continue this moving forward. We showed up uh, in front of them on January 3rd. You know, I had given them a 20-page uh, uh, project management description to read, another 20 pages of uh, slides. I, Frankly, it might have been bad timing. You know, we were trying to get there quickly, A, to follow y'all's guidance, but B, because like I say, we now are to a critical stage in this uh, projects. So I, I wonder with the holidays, et cetera, if perhaps some of the TDC members didn't have the time that they ordinarily would have had to prepare for this meeting because I, I had the same impression that uh, Ms. White did, frankly. Thank you. Any other commissioners have comment that had made already? Commissioner Peach, do you, do you feel comfortable? Do you want to make a, a motion on this? Um, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out where we're at, Julie. Um, I know we we need the or the 117 is there for the habitats. There's outstanding balance of 354. I could tell you the TDC, you know, did, did think that was a large pill to swallow, especially with what's coming down the pike for requests from the TDC, both from the beach and and. Uh, you know, we still have the butterfly house out there that's looking diligently for places to land, uh, pardon the pun, if you will. Um, you know, so they were worried about the precedent setting if we funded a half a million dollars off the top, you know, to an organization like this that, you know, the train is going to keep coming. So those were the TDC's concerns. Um, I share some of those concerns. I would like to find a way to, to get this project moving forward and get it here. I'm just not that familiar if there's uncommitted, you know, county funds or it's all got to come from the TDC. Um, that's a pill I don't know that the TDC is ready to swallow at this time. So I'm, I would look to my fellow commissioners for advice if I can. Julie, uh, sorry, Commissioner Lynch. And, and I, I, I certainly appreciate what Commissioner Peach is saying there. That was my concern listening to the conversation. I'm, uh, I'm afraid we might get out over our skis a little bit too far um, if we were to fund more than the TDC has has authorized because we do have the marine science park out on the beach that is a huge expense at some point we don't know where the funding is going to come from um, and then there's the butterfly house we you know we do have these requests that we know are going to come from Navarre for uh, either TDT or uh, other 
sources of funding, some, some type of general fund. So uh, we need to be cognizant of that when we're allocating these funds. If I support the project, just uh, we have to be careful in the, the amounts that we're committing to uh, these different causes. Commissioner Cole. Thank you. And <clears throat> my comments earlier would not have been to fund the 400 or let's call it half a million dollars, but I'm certainly willing to. And, and the comments were made that the, the wildlife refuge can get groups to do habitats. Uh, and I think with the other buildings finished, it, it would be more incentive for another group to come in and say, hey, I want to build that eagle cage. I want to build whatever, possum house, whatever whatever happens to be, because now you have boots on the ground, you have structure on the ground that shows that organization. You know, an organization may come in, Navy Federal, and they say, hey, we, we, want, it. we want our sign on that, uh, on that flight, uh, you know, flight sanctuary. Uh, so I, I think, you know, I'd be willing to fund, you know, like the 300, 354,000 and, uh, and then pull back the other. So basically we're not, you know, we're not stepping over the TDC by the, you know, by 354,000, but, but a, a figure that's almost halfway above what they authorized. Uh, so just for clarification, I'd, I'd, that's where I'd be willing to go to but not above so thank you sir well, well, I apologize Please. I Please just can. I'm gonna try to bring this into a land I know we've been on this a little over 25 minutes on this one item um, Julie do you know off the top of your head or roundabouts where we're at on the unallocated fund balance there we, we haven't even talked about what we actually have in that fund it's about 1.4 million but but out of that is part of that obligated no that's that's not that's unallocated um funds in the tourism development tax reserve and that's not counting the seven hundred and fifty thousand, or it is counting it's Correct. not okay. it's not counting that so we have unallocated 1.4 million now as commissioner lyncher was just saying down and that's what i told them that day at the meeting we and it's not we i support these people it's not that it's just that we don't have enough money to fund the requests that are coming down the road is the issue that I see in the next three to four years and I know you've said that you really are focused on trying to improve the beach as well because we know that's where the tourism money is coming so I mean I don't want you to shortchange your own requests that we know are coming absolutely I mean there's a request coming from the leaseholders pretty soon to for the TDC to irrigate Gulf Boulevard so I mean there is there's gonna be so many projects coming down the road that we're we will run out of money probably Mr. eventually you know Commissioner Cole when a project comes to us there's a time to worry about those yes, funding sir. then and when a project puts in as much sweat equity as these folks have done then we take a look at it but two three four years down the road TDC dollars are going to continue to come in I mean we're dealing with things today that are going to increase that value to Santa Rosa County so when butterfly people come back you know they better be talking hey we got 61 62 percent in the bank this is what we need or that we're this far down the road this is what we need don't come in just with two open hands come in with one hand filled and the other hand needs some help like <coughs> Mr. You. Peach said a leg up not a you know not a helping hand but a but a way to get to where we need to go and I I, I does it does anybody feel comfortable making a motion at this point I, unless Dave wants to make it I'll make it. I'll give you the honor. I know y'all give me the duty of, of getting these uh, meetings done in a timely <laughs> manner so mr. chairman may I make one final comment uh, my appointment my comment echoes uh, commissioner Coles uh, exactly you know we have been actively engaged uh, with this commission now like I say since May the numbers haven't changed we have uh, funded ourselves and I keep hearing hypotheticals about what's going to happen with future requests from people who have done lesser or greater jobs of trying to help themselves we have helped ourselves we have actively worked you know I'll speak candidly since the name was brought up you know as of October we thought we were going to be offering the butterfly house a place to live and then two weeks before that decision was made, 
after the recommendation for the county administrator was to go forward with that recommendation, they pulled the rug out from underneath my organization as well as themselves. And I continue to hear people talk about the Panhandle Butterfly House. Frankly, they have a ways to go before they come to you with a coherent plan. What I'm telling you is construction is going to stop if we don't get significant amounts of funding for our, I just want everybody to be cognizant of that. This isn't a what if for what for us or a hypothetical. This is what's facing the commission Thank today. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lynchard, I'd saw your light on a second ago. Sorry. Commissioner. I Go I was ahead. just going to say, I would. You were asking what people would support. I would support the 117,000 shifting it to uh, construction um, to allow that to continue. And if there's more to come, I would. I would rather go back and have the TDC make that re recommendation rather than approving 354,000 dollars today. That's a, that's three times what the TDC approved in their meeting. So, uh, last question I'll ask you because I know yes, we're uh, really trying to conclude here for a motion the 354 is are you talking about funding all this out of pocket or are we have we factored in any finance mechanisms or sir uh, when I took over the board of directors of the Emerald Coast Wildlife Refuge the organization was about two hundred and forty thousand dollars in debt they were struggling to survive in this uh, period of time since Mitch and I have been at the helm we are now a debt for your organization <laughs> And we are doing everything in our power to remain so, as does every other nonprofit, because frankly, uh, outstanding debt is the death of nonprofit organizations. If we are put in a position where we have no choice but to go after funding uh, through uh, debt structures, we will certainly do so. What I'm here to tell you is ECWR has been down that path before. It didn't work out well for them at all. I, I and there is precedence for the two hundred thousand dollars of funding for other nonprofits in the bar. And I appreciate that. The reason I, I say is I know even when we talked about setting aside fifty thousand dollars <coughs> for the year for a total sum for multiple businesses to come in, there were still issues that commissioners brought up, such as callbacks, businesses selling, businesses and that's fifty thousand versus a lot bigger number that we're talking about and I, and you gotta understand. So I, I'm trying to Look at the optics here. Of, um, I'm with Commissioner Lynchard. I, I don't think it should ever be construed that if we say, "Hey, we're willing to give an organization over a hundred thousand dollars," that that's not support. Um, it's just I know what it's like to look at those citizens. That that's exactly what they are. We appoint citizens to help give us recommendations, and I feel like I've learned to lean heavily on that. I've also learned to lean on Julie's recommendations because. That is her job, and, and we hold her job accountable for performance standards of that tourism bed tax collection revenue. And <clears throat> so I give that a lot of weight. So I don't, I don't want you to think by any means if I don't say, hey, I want to go against them, that it's not support. I mean, it's still over $100,000, which is, again, twice the number that we just stated we had some issues with earlier on, on giving our business community. So I guess I wrap back to the business communities. I know, unfortunately, some of them, and I love the Dave Ramsey program. I wish I could say that I was totally debt free right now. But I know a lot of businesses, unfortunately, have to finance things and leverage. So I only say that because I don't think, as a business owner, and I know other men up here have been doing it longer than me, but I don't think the fact that if we leveraged 117000 that that would bring construction to a halt. It just may mean that you have to explore other avenues, such as a financing or something that you may not be willing to do and that's fine but I don't think that it means that if you go to a bank and say here's a hundred and seventeen thousand commitment and we still need two-thirds financing I don't know a lender that wouldn't do it especially with the equity so I just from my opinion I don't think that it's really a hey it's a halt but it may be a halt at without financing but um, I, I kind of echo Commissioner Lynch's feelings and again that's not a, a non-supportive thing I don't need to get into any further and again I only I know these guys give me the responsibility of wrapping this up and we've been on it over 30 minutes Commissioner Salter <clears throat> very quickly mr. chairman Julie the TDC is committed hundred and seventeen thousand this year and another hundred and seventeen thousand next year no sir I thought you said that no, that wasn't that was an option he stated oh, okay. as one of his options he we may consider just want a clarification Commissioner Cole. Uh, I would be supportive of Commissioner Lynchard's suggestion, but with the request that the TDC review this at the next meeting for an additional amount, 
Uh, I'll, I'll let Commissioner Peach maybe suggest that. I would suggest maybe 170, 200,000 additional to keep this moving forward. Uh, that way it's vetted through the TDC. We can hear some more about it, have some options. You can keep moving forward. Uh, or the other thing would be to obligate to the 117 this year and again out of the next fiscal year. And I have no issue. I, I don't want to hold up his building or anything. So I, I don't have an issue recommending as your director that we move that 117 towards his medical f facility. That's that's fine for me as well. And I think the TDC would understand. Thank you, Commissioner Peach. You want to bring us in for landing? Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would concur with Julie on the 117 being used for facilities, get that medical facility up. I think that's key. That's leaving an outstanding balance of 77,000, I think, according to your course of action bill to get just the medical facility complete, correct? Because you have down here as an option 194. I'm trying to sort through it. Yeah, the, the 194 is you funding the 194 for us to get that medical center completed. We don't have, uh, if you're giving us 117, an additional $70,000 uh, to get that center completed. And, and just point of clarification, we're a nonprofit supporting the five uh, Gulf Coast counties here. We are not a commercial enterprise. We are not an income uh, producing. So the comparison between us and small business it is frankly difficult for us to hear because it's just not the case. Okay. So, go ahead. You can't get open until the medical facilities open. That's correct, sir. The state and federal authorities will not allow us to transfer our operations or the animals here until that medical facility is open. Well, I would open a conversation that we move the 117 to enough to complete the medical facility at this time and then discuss future funding which is you, you need what to finish 194 194 sir to complete the medical center okay let's see if we can get support for that because I, I would support completing that facility getting you in the getting getting the gates open so you can start getting revenue flow yes sir so. And, and my newness would be that this would be from TDC or is there any other funds available, Jay, on committed balances or anything? Other to honor the TDC's recommendation. No, I mean, I other know. than our, our fund balance, there's um, electric franchise fee funding, you know, there for an economic development. Um, you know, we can look at it. Okay. Um, okay. I think with the reserves TDC has that $194,000, $195,000 isn't going to put us in a bad situation. If, I'll make a motion that we fund a, the completion of the medical center and uh, look for a second on that motion or move it without objection. Which would be the 194? Yes, 194. sir. I'll, I'll make that motion without objection or make a motion to move it to Thursday's consent agenda. Consent agenda without objection all right hearing none we'll move that to thursday's no, consent agenda i think no commissioner let you that I, I was just going to suggest regular agenda since we're still talking about funding source and all right everything else. we'll uh, we'll move that to thursday's regular agenda with a recommendation of funding one hundred ninety-four thousand to your building thank you commissioners thank you all right thank you uh, item number six is the uh, discussion of approval for speed signs to be placed on existing county speed limit signposts. I know we've got uh, a few folks here, if you will, come up, state your name, address, and thank you for bearing with us. Uh, we've got a PowerPoint, correct? What's up? Very good. Okay, yes, uh, Peter Burkhead, 8004 Gulf Breeze Boulevard, uh, Navarre, Florida. Thank you very much, gentlemen and staff. Sorry we're for so late. We got hung up in a big mess. So we appreciate uh, allowing us in front of you today. So the good thing is, I believe my request will be pretty simple, and I'm not asking for any money. 
speed signs on White Sands Boulevard. I'll give you a little background in history. Speeding on White, and this, excuse me, this is Larry Hoffman. Hi, I'm Sorry. Larry Hoffman, 1415 Homeport in Navarre. Thank okay, you. thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Speeding on White Sands has been an issue for years due to the ease of transversing the island on a road with limited access, few intersections, and light traffic. White Sands is a popular sought after alternative to Gulf Boulevard, which has heavier traffic and multi access points. Given that Navarre Beach is not a designated separate patrol area for the Sheriff's Office, deputies are only assigned to patrol the island on an as available basis. Because of this, at least until recently, patrols have been limited. This past June 2018, a pedestrian, Larry Holmes, was struck while walking and running on White Sands. Larry was seriously injured and, con and was confined to a wheelchair for four months. This was followed by six months of physical therapy. The driver of the car was only cited for careless driving as there was no witnesses. Next slide. There is a picture of the island. You can see where Gulf Boulevard is and you can see where White Sands is. Next slide. As a result of this occurrence and the residents who live on White Sands being fed up with the speeders, members of the NBLRA worked with Stephen Furman to reposition several speed limit signs and add two additional speed signs to White Sands Boulevard. So that was completed. In addition, the MBLRA formed the Neighborhood Watch Committee with the help of the Sheriff's Office in July of 2018. Robin Otto, a resident of White Sands, chairs the committee. Sheriff Johnson at the time, Lieutenant Jason Earlman, Chief of District 2, which includes Navarre Beach, attended the Neighborhood Watch program meet monthly meetings and is instrumental in assisting with getting the program up and running. As a result, additional patrols have been added to White Sands Boulevard, and we're quite grateful for that. And the, ne the Nextdoor app, a neighborhood community phone application that connects residents of the same community to assist others in monitoring and reporting of serious accidents and legal activity, has 250 users on Navarre Beach. The, the idea is that through awareness, community monitoring, and more reporting, criminal activity may lower. We are just now beginning to see results. Next slide. The current situation, in addition to the next door app, the Neighborhood Watch Committee decided to look into your speed is signs in either direction on White Sands. In other words, one sign for eastbound and one sign for westbound travelers. When MBLRA approached Stephen Furman in Santa Rosa County about this, they were told the county only had one such sign and it was not working properly and there was no additional funding for signs. So I, Peter Burke, had raised $5,500 needed to purchase the two signs donate through donations to, from three NBLRA members. Once achieving this, I then sought and received written agreement from Stephen Furman to install the signs on existing speed limit signs. Your speed sign would be placed above the static speed limit sign. Stephen also agreed that MBLA would maintain ownership and be responsible for maintenance of the signs. I also sought and received written agreement from Lieutenant Earlman that if MBLRA provided data showing when most of the speeding was occurring, he would do his best to deploy additional patrols in the area. Your speed sign is collect and store data that can be retrieved via Bluetooth. Next slide. There's a picture of what I'm talking about. So you have the PowerPoint, which is the uh, cell, cell panel, and then you have the speed that flashes your speed, then it's sitting on top of a static sign. Next slide. No sooner than I was going to collect the donations and place the order, I received an email from Dan telling me to hold off and we needed to discuss. When MBLRA met with Dan and Roy Anders, we were told that MBLRA would have to assume liabilities for the signs. Given that MBLRA is not in position to assume liability, I suggested we donate the signs to the county, relinquish our ownership, provide the, pr provided the county keeps the signs on the beach. Dan and Roy would not agree to this and repeatedly said that MBLRA had to assume liability. Unfortunately, MBLRA or the, nor the donors of the signs are in a position to assume liability. We are willing to collect the data and provide it to the sheriff's office and we're willing to maintain the signs. This is where you, the BOCC, come in. So here's the request. 
MBLRA is requesting that the BOCC allow MBLRA to donate two year speed signs to Santa Rosa County and place them on white sands at locations identified by the Sheriff's Office. MBLRA further agrees to provide data to the Sheriff's Office to whatever frequency the Sheriff shall desire. MBLRA further agrees to maintain the signs in good working order and conduct, and conduct repairs immediately upon discovering them. In return, Santa Rosa County assumes all liabilities for the signs as it has with all other signs throughout the county. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Peach. Uh, Mr. Chairman, fellow commissioners, um, I've, I've been briefed on this extensively. I've met with the leaseholders. Um, I'm kind of a, a risk averse guy. I look at it. Uh, I think these residents want to do a good thing to help patrol their neighborhood. The liability I think we're talking about assuming would be if the signs blew off and flew through someone's windshield or fell on someone, that would be the liability I think we're talking about. Not as far as a lawsuit saying it told me I was going 100 miles an hour or anything. So my position is like with most other signs in the county, if, if we have a storm that's blowing signs off, we're going to have a lot more to worry about. So I'm, I'm of the mindset to support these signs. They're going to maintain them. They're going to transfer the data. I think we're going to put them up and, uh, you know, Hopefully, God doesn't hit us with a storm that would take those signs, <laughs> launch them off the poles, and hit someone or hit someone's car. But you know, when I look at the the risk, the risk of more speeders on White Sands Boulevard far outweighs the risk of assuming a liability on those signs. In my opinion, um, well, it was my recommendation, as it is any time that we have um, a structure in our right of way that the the person who installs or maintains or in this case uh, furnishes them and either retains ownership or transfers them to us to send any, any liability related to that. Uh, a, uh, a reasonable or uh, a diligent attorney is going to find a way to uh, at least assess liability that's going to be something more than just if these things blow off and, and hit a car. If they're not operating um, in, if, they're, if they are not operating as they should be operating, then they would uh, allege that the county had liability for that. Uh, and and any other thing that a, that a plaintiff's attorney is going to be able to come up with. It's not a great a lot of amount of liability, but the county has no liability at this point if we allow these to be uh, erected or if we erect them and uh, have them there, then we're going to have more liability than we have now. It's something that the board has every right to uh, to address and assume with the understanding that um, if there is uh, an allegation, we're going to have to defend that. Can I just can I ask a, a, a simple question about that? I just because this is what baffles me. I, I don't know the number, but I'm going to throw it out there. There's probably 250,000 signs in this county. I'm just going to pick a number. It may be good. It may be bad. I don't know. I don't get where two signs make any difference. And I don't understand because I guess I'm not a lawyer. Who does it matter who owns them? I mean, if they're if they're on a county poll, they're they're part of the county sign system. Now, I would go so far if I can get the approval from my donors because I proposed this to Mr. Andrews as well, but I'll propose it again. I, I think I might get the approval from our donors. I'll give you the signs. I don't have to own the signs. I would just ask that if I did give you the signs, you keep them on the beach. Because once we solve the problem on Gulf, on White Sands, we might want to ask Mr. Furman to move them to Gulf Boulevard. Because we got a problem there too, although it's not as bad as I pointed out in my presentation. So, I, you know, if it takes giving you the signs, I'll give you the signs. I got to get the donors to approve that, but I'm hoping, hopefully they, they'll, they'll be okay. But I don't get the difference between two signs versus the 250 signs, 250,000 signs that you have on the beach. I don't understand that, so. That's why uh, every time you, <clears throat> I was kind of off color, but I was gonna say every time you turn on TV, you see an attorney ad, I, I think Amen. he's really just yeah. doing his job to say, hey guys, you could bring a lawsuit, but uh, 
uh, you know, we go to that. Anyway, we got another attorney who wants to chime in, so I'm going to defer to Commissioner Lynchard here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the, the primary difference is this sign is an electronic sign, and they do malfunction. Our speed limit signs up there that are black tape on a reflective 3M backing don't malfunction. They may come down, uh, and when they come down, we replace them within a, a reasonable time. Uh, <clears throat> so this, this sign, would, if it malfunctions, and we're not maintaining it, you're maintaining it. If it's left in an unmaintained state for 10 days or two weeks and something happens in that 10 days or two weeks, we knew that it was not functioning in the way that it was designed and there's some potential liability on the part of the county. If we, uh, Mr. Andrews, if, if we had some provision in here that if the sign, if, if the county was notified that the sign was not maintained or was not operating uh, appropriately, uh, they have a duty to maintain it. Uh, that maintenance would have to be done within so many days. Otherwise, the sign would be taken down until such time as it was put back in working order. Would that, would that, would that help. go to, to would help. eliminate our... Sure. Now, I have a question here. about that. You'll, you'll know that the, the, the picture I use is, is the one on uh, National Seashore. You know, it's not always turned on. They don't have it on all the time. So uh, I would like ours on all the time, but there may come a point where we turn it off. Are you opposed to us turning it off? It'll structurally be sound, but it may not, may not be operating. I don't know that it has to operate 24-7. Now, if you tell me it does, then that's what I'll do. But I don't know that it has to be operating all the time. It, it, and I don't know either. I don't know if there's yeah, anything I mean, in the I, <clears throat> uniform uh, traffic manual for maintenance that they, would require it 24-7 or not. If there's not, then I wouldn't have any objection to us working out some schedule yeah. um, for, okay. for having it operational. But if we can just, in my mind, if, if, uh, if we can put uh, a requirement, and I'll let Roy and Stephen come up with the, what that number is, a requirement that if it's, not, if it's not in an operational state, that it will be removed or bagged or, or uh, in some yeah. other manner uh, uh, taken That's out fair. of commission until such time as it's put in operational state, yeah. I would be fine with it. We can, I think we can go in that direction. Mr. Commissioner Cole. Thank you. I appreciate what the community did out there. I mean, we we put signs over at East Milton, same thing. It's, it's helped immensely. Yeah. It's unbelievable how people go past, you know, an elementary school and not pay attention to the signs or anything else. But if we're speaking in scenarios like what if a sign flew off and hit somebody what if it wasn't working we post we post let me give you this scenario we post streets at 25 mile an hour i'm hit by somebody that's doing 35 can i sue the county because you didn't have a patrolman out there making him go to 25 instead of 35 i mean we can scenario things all day long and i, I think appreciate that would be the sheriff's department actually what? i'd be interested in that one <laughs> well i mean you know you know so I think the benefit outweighs the weaknesses of it because if we can keep people from speeding, that's what we want to do. And the accidents that that could yeah. alleviate, I think, outweighs the. And, and Roy, thank you for doing your job, but I think it's time for us to do our job and take these signs and, and hand us. So. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Salter. I support Commissioner Lynchard. So with that, with what I'm hearing from the board is what we will take what is in your backup is a, a memorandum of agreement basically to, to govern this because of, um, uh, I didn't want to own or operate these signs or maintain these signs. That's, we have enough for Stephen and the Public Works Sign Department to do already. Um, so we'll take and modify paragraph four of that, which is the indemnification paragraph to um, address Commissioner Lynchard's comments and, and put some uh, language or period in there so I would recommend we, we, we do that between now and Thursday and, and leave that on the regular agenda Peter thank you so much for y'all bringing us forward I wish I'd love to see some folks in my district raise some funds for this I know we hear about traffic and pedestrians yeah. um, I'll wholeheartedly support that as well I, I would have supported honestly the county taking them and uh, the way I look at it is the folks are gonna step up and pay for it then you know, sure. like Commissioner Pete said, but it sounds like we're going to get the best of both. So right. we want to move this to, you want to make a motion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, fellow commissioners. Great point, Commissioner Lynchard. I recommend we move this to uh, Thursday's regular agenda with the modified language of a certain time frame to keep the signs operational and maintained. 
without objection. We'll move that to Thursday's regular agenda. Oh, can I just make one statement? So I just want to be crystal clear that the document that I'm going to be asked to sign on behalf of the leaseholders is not going to have anything relative to liability other than the maintenance and care of and monitoring of however you want to state all that. I want to make sure that's what it's going to say. That's correct. I yeah, want to be clear, clear, because you know I don't have to come before you all again because it's not what, what we're talking about. I just want to be crystal clear. Is that, 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 that's correct. That's what the okay. board voted to. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you so much. Yes. And thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate your time this morning. All right. That concludes the administrative committee. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna move, I know we've got a presentation here on animal services. Could we take a five minute break? I need to. Uh, and then we will. Re
ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna we're gonna get started back. I'm gonna ask uh, Commissioner Cole if he'll lead us into the Public Services Committee, and we've got Brad Baker here with an update. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're gonna have a discussion of assessing fines, review of short-term and long-term plans uh, going forward, and approval of transfer of thirty thousand dollars from reserve for contingencies to support recommended spay and neuter program. Mr. Baker. Yeah, thank you, Commission. I just wanted to review um, back in October of 2018, Team Shelter USA came into Santa Rosa County and completed a, an assessment of our animal services program. I have sent you the um, report along with the summary of recommended actions that the team did for us. I did um, highlight that into what we felt like we could do either already have completed or in progress short term and long term. And when I talk about short term, you know, I'm thinking in a six month window and then long term would be at least one more physical year because either um, too much to absorb this. They're drinking through a fire hose over there at Animal Services, or um, it will require some additional um, monetary commitment on behalf of the county, so we'll go through the budget cycle with that. Um, but I did want to highlight that, of course, their finding is really, there are a couple primary focuses. One of them is intake mitigation. And that is where we, uh, we're actually doing a version of that right now because our shelter is full as of last week. So we're not taking anything but stray animals in, um, hopefully through tomorrow. Um, so no owner surrenders. You decide you don't want your pet, you bring it to the shelter and turn it over to us, and now it's our problem. Um, so that is one of the intake mitigations. So we're doing a, a version of that right now. Um, but our staff is a little concerned that, uh, you know, our direction has always been that we're for the welfare of the animal as well. And if we uh, turn away somebody who doesn't want their animal, then you know they're, they're concerned for what might happen to that animal, whether it be you know, tied to a, a telephone pole or, or left to roam or get ate by the coyotes or whatever that may be. So we do ask that we can take some of these incrementally and make sure that we're looking out for the welfare of the animal as well. The other one, as you know from reading the assessment or, or listening to the presentation they did the other major focus for that is return to field um, which is a term we're going to use return to field so that is uh, we take a, a stray cat in and we collected it from the Navarre area um, that the, the process for that would be that we would take that animal in, we would vaccinate it, get it curred on all its vaccinations, get it fixed with a spay or neuter, and then we would return it to the location that it was. Now, I just want to make it clear that we do not support in any way um, colonization. You know, this is not something that, that we're trying to get a colony of cats formed. We're actually trying to prevent colonization. And if we can get those um, cats spayed and neutered, along with obviously rabies vaccinations and other things for the health and well being, not only animal, but our community as well, then we think that we're moving in the right direction. To kind of give you some stats for 2018, um, we took in. 5,772 animals into the shelter. Of that, we euthanized 3,647 for a 65% rate. Uh, if you look at the cat side of that, we took in 3,294 cats and we euthanized 2,813 for 85%. So obviously we understand that cat um, issues are our problem and what we have been doing in Santa Rosa County is not working. Uh, they have proven that the return to field option has worked um, in many cases throughout Florida but throughout the United States. So uh, this has proven um, ways to uh, mitigate intake and the health and welfare of our community as well. Um, so obviously for us to do that, it would take some ordinance changes. Um, I believe you all have, all have seen the red line ordinance and it's primarily geared toward um, return to the field or trap neuter release program. Um, there are some other changes that we would like to make to the ordinance that would help us out at animal services, such as um, we would like to change it up um, to a three day hole versus a five day. We'd like to take um, kitten and puppy litters off of the hold altogether because you do not um, have a litter of kittens or puppies uh, walk away from your house. 
So um, they were dropped off at the shelter for a reason. And if we have to keep them right now, it's for five days. That's putting a lot of uh, not only problems onto the pet because they're in a shelter environment for those that amount of time and exposed to everything that happens when you put a lot of animals together. Also, the people are not coming to claim them, and we know that. So, um, you know, those are just a few of the things I'll go through. Um, well, let me hit one other thing. We're asking for a total of $30,000 uh, to come from, from the contingency line. And what that will do, in the report you can see that they recommend us um, to institute a spay-neuter program um, for those who are financially restrained. And, uh, you know, they recommend that we, we supply 875 surgeries for low-income pet owners. We have worked out an agreement with the Pensacola Humane Society and uh, that 20,000 that we're asking for would, uh, would get us about, if you took the average, um, it would get us 365 um, spay neuters for low income. And you know, it would be however we want to determine that low income in Escambia County. You know, you can show a WIC check, you can show that you get any support from the federal government, whatever it is. We can make it as stringent or not as we want to. Um, so that, that is one of the requests we're doing. The other one, I, I want to introduce um, our part-time vet as well. Um, and I'm going to try to do this right because she told me a way that I could do it. Um, Dr. Megan Aravello. And uh, she has also agreed to be called Dr. Megan for my sake. So, um, but Dr. Megan, uh, not only is she part-time with us now, and um, she has reached out to all our vet partners. So we don't have a surgical facility that we can do spay neuters. So for all the animals that come in, by the time you know they can get to adoption and, and be fixed so that we know that they're fixed when they leave our facility, we have to wait in line with one of our, our wonderful vets that are in our community. So re she re reached out to them, and obviously that's a, a financial problem for them because you know we might be paying them $65 to do a a spay neuter where if they had a client that they left open that spot for they might get anywhere from 200 to maybe up to 500 if it's a large dog um, so they've either asked that we increase our amount to uh, for them to do surgeries in their suite or what they'd really like to do is um, go over to the Humane Society on a Friday Saturday or Sunday and they've offered their facility and we would pay them an hourly rate um, to do those only animals that are through the shelter. They did not want, you know, obviously they're, they don't want to do for the general public because that's their client. So the, they have offered if the, we could partner with them. Um, and that's what I'm asking the other $10,000 to, to offset our veterinarian budget so that we can get some of these vets within our community to uh, come on for a day over at the Pensacola Humane Society and do, um, high volume spay neuters for our animals so that we can get them into the adoption line faster. So the whole thing about the shelter business, and, and I've learned a lot in, in the short time I've been in there, but obviously it's movement. So either we have to we have to limit the amount that we take in, and then we have to move animals through there because it is not in the best interest of the animal to stay in our shelter for three months. So either we have to get our adopt, adoptable animals up or we have to drive our intake down. And obviously, cats are our biggest problem, and the proven way to do that is to do a um, return to field program. So what I'd really like to get, other than the monetary support and get the programs going with, with the two that we've asked for, I would also like to entertain a pilot program for return to the field, um, targeted areas. We have a couple through our community that are really um, high cat intake volumes, and we would like to tackle that with a return to field. We'd partner with some of these that are out um, feeding the, the cats or anybody we could work a partnership with, bring them in, vaccinate, get them fixed, and return them out until we can come back with you for an ordinance. And the other thing that I would like your feedback on before we go to the ordinance review, um, there are a couple of things that I want to make sure that, that if we're going to spend our time and energy that it's something the board is interested in. Uh, the one thing obviously is return to field. Uh, that requires a lot of ordinance change. We've got to make a lot of recommendations, so we'll make sure that's the direction you want us to go. And the other thing would be pet licensing. Um, pet licensing is all around 
the state. It's on both sides of us, Escambia and Okaloosa does that. The one thing that that would do, obviously we would focus on a, if your pet, obviously they'd have to be vaccinated to get a, a license. So rabies vaccination is a key to that. But the other thing we would offer a reduced rate if your animal is fixed because pets reproducing is our problem. And if we don't fix spay and neuter in our county, we will continue to have that. So the pet license would do a couple of things. It would help augment our uh, spay and neuter program. And it would also allow us to go to a full-time vet. Um, you know, depending on, if you look at the revenue generated in Escambia County, and I would say we have a similar number of pets um, they generate about $400,000, $450,000, and uh, they only collect about um, what they determine. I believe the number he gave me was about 60% of their collectible revenue. So um, if that is something that, that interests the board, I will make that part of the ordinance review that we'll bring back to you in, in a month or so and uh, work with Roy and the attorney staff on getting the, the ordinance in shape of so that's the kind of the direction I need from you guys is, is uh, are you supportive of the 20,000 that's gonna go to a low cost spay neuter for our citizens through partnership with the Humane Society? Do you support the 10,000 that will go to help offset our cost to put part-time or additional veterinarian services on staff? And then is the um, direction the board wants to go to look at a return to field option in our ordinance and also um, do you support a um, pet licensing? All right, uh, Commissioner Parker, then Commissioner Peach. Uh, first, thank you for, for partnering with the county and I wish I'd have known you were here sooner. We'd have tried to get you earlier on the agenda, but I apologize. A uh, couple questions real quick for Brad. I noticed here in the background it says one of the changes is we're no longer setting up traps. So now if I call in about um, feral cats or whatever, Roman, they, they don't come out and do that. I know that. They that do was... not. You can go purchase a trap. They sell them all around our county at the local hardware stores. Right. You can set that trap and you can bring the animal to our shelter and we will take that animal from you. We, not... we will just not go out and do all the work for the citizen. And I, and I also want to give credit before I forget uh, the next thing. I, I know Brandy and, and Deb and a few other people here in the audience that have worked tirelessly for a year to get us to this point of some improvements. Um, I commend you on, on your efforts. Not trying to be funny, but we do live in a large portion of our county's rural area. I'm just facing realities here. If we tell somebody that we're not going to come out and trap them, they've got feral cats in the area. <clears throat> do people, and I, and I know I was in law enforcement, but I'll be honest with you, didn't deal with this a lot. And, it's been a few years. Would there be repercussions if people say, okay, I'll handle it? And I, I think we all kind of know where that goes, especially in, in farm communities. But then a neighbor comes in because somebody dispatches that animal. Are they now at criminal liability for handling that? <clears throat> I mean, because you may talk with, and not just a farmer, but I'll use a farmer, for example, because I, I spent uh you know the bulk of my afternoon up in schmuckland j area yesterday and it, it is it's a, a great way of living but it's a different way of living than when we're talking about milton or navarre you tell a guy you're not going to come get a cat and he says okay i'll handle it but then a neighbor that may have been feeding the cat and this is something that regularly happens i've told Dylan, says okay and they go out there and, and dispatch the cat or are they under any sort of criminal <clears throat> liability I would say yes, um, without knowing all the statues, but right. there, you, if the animal, domestic or whatever, is pursuing your livestock or your chickens or whatever, um, then you have the right to defend your property. And, and that to me is the only concern I have over us saying that, hey, we're no longer going to go trap nuisance animals, but yet we're going to tell a man that we expect him to spend more money to go get his own trap and time to set it versus I, I don't I don't know that I really like it but <clears throat> not a lot of hard room my other uh, I just wanted to verify if that was correct what I was reading and the other uh, question you mentioned pet licensing <clears throat> are we talking about that would be defined to dogs and cats or now I know in the 
year past. We've talked about pigs. We've talked about chickens. You know, at, at where a point do we determine is my six chickens pets or livestock? And, and honestly, I just look at this as something I really never anticipated getting involved in. So I'm, I'm asking that question yes. with, I, a, with a straight face here. I, so. I, I, and the reason why I chuckle is because you know we have now gotten into the pig business ourselves at animal services because um the wildlife officer doesn't consider i mean the livestock officer doesn't consider pot belly pigs as livestock so we have to go get them when there's a problem now so that's the only reason i chuckle i chuckle on dale's behalf back there right right yeah um, and, I, and i'm not trying to be funny but this is it is but our our goal for pet licenses is for um dogs and cats um, we take in rabbits and and pigs and uh, a macaw and whatever else that shows up, but we uh, the focus would be on on um, dogs and cats. Would, would that program basically say that I'm sure everybody up here, or at least the majority of us, have an animal at home, a dog or cat? That then I would have some sort of time requirement. I would have to bring it to come get licensed, and if I didn't, there's a penalty. And what would the repercussion be now with us i mean i know we're already honestly struggling publicly with our code enforcement so now what are implementations we would have to do if if say i didn't bring my dog in to get licensed and what you know I, i'm just looking at some of the right. callback features this board is now getting involved in if we do that yes we would i mean my thought in researching and reaching out to the different counties that have them in there it, it would require an additional staff on on at animal services to follow up with those and we would send out a an email or a note that says hey your pet license is due to renew in in, in a month from now um, we would want to partner with our vets so when they get um, their rabies vaccinated update that it would be a way that they could just go ahead and collect that pet license fee as well and then the other option they would like to do and you know uh, talk back and forth with adrian a little bit if we could do some online version um, that they could pay for their pet license. I think that's the easiest route for people. If you can go on and say, all right, well, my kind of like the tax collector, you know, I know my property tax was due. I can go online and I can pay that. So if, if that would be the option, um, the main thing it would, it would do is it would give us a revenue source that would support a, a full-time veterinarian along with help offset these dollars that we need to contribute to spay neuter, um, in our county because if we don't fix it it's only going to get worse we we've proven with our numbers if you look over the last several years of the numbers that you saw from the assessment team putting out there um what we're doing is not working so we we can either try something new and, and hope that it works or tweak it in, in, until it does work or we can keep on with a 85 percent euthanasia number so i i'll conclude with this I, I know you asked for our direction and i'm only one of five and i know this is again a committee meeting and not one where we vote i just transparently share some res reservations i get strong reservations that i would have to those two items in particular and moving forward and i guess just because <clears throat> in a lot of ways i feel like i've got the government involved in plenty of aspects of my life and i don't know that i'm really eager to jump on a, a whole nother licensing venue that now the county government's involved in but that's just me thank you right, commissioner peach thank you uh, commissioner cole brad you and your folks thanks this this is to me long overdue dr megan thanks for what you're doing for us um and brandy and deb <clears throat> um i personally one of the first questions i asked when i moved to 13 different locations throughout my career was where do i get a license for my dog we have four I want to be number one, two, three, and four when you, we, if we start a licensing program because it's a good thing. It's responsible pet ownership. Um, I like your thoughts on they have to be rabies. If they're chipped, if they're fixed, there's a, there's a structured fee. It brings funds and responsible pet owners, which there are many more than the irresponsible ones, I believe, just to help support the programs that we're putting in. And, and there's ways to implement them. I, I, I know uh, Chairman Parker has some reservations, but I can get a license tag for my truck online. Um, so there's technology that our constitutional officers that are using that could make this process work. So I support your, uh, your efforts, uh, your request here, and your future efforts on dog licensing. And, and 
will personally work with you if you'd like my input on that from all the different cities and counties I've lived in throughout my career. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Chairman. Solder won the race. <coughs> Brad, Brad said what we're doing now is not working. I strongly support return to the field, spay and neuter, because it's all they're going to do is keep multiplying. So I strongly support that. I'll support the licensing as well. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Richard. Thank you, Dr. Megan, for being here this morning. I, <clears throat> I agree with, with, with Don there and, and a lot of the, the comments the other commissioners made. I support uh, the, the additional dollars for the spay and neuter program and the veterinary services um, as well as the return to field. Um, the pet licensing, I think it'll be interesting to see how that discussion goes when we get there. Uh, as you develop that program, I know Don said he was in favor of it, but one thing the board may want to consider is implementing that first in those areas in the county where we have leash laws. That would be the south end of the county. So a little tougher for Dave and I, but I think it's a, it's a much easier sell down there than it is in the north end of the county. I could be wrong. You guys can, can, can weigh in on that. But it, it would tie in as well with the leash law area having, having the licensing requirement. Um, in, in, in those areas where we have leash laws in the south end of the county. So just a thought as you move forward with that. And it, it also how in the south end of the county, would they have to come to the department to have their license, uh, to, to get their initial license? Several do it in different ways, but obviously if you can provide a, a validated current rabies vaccination that we can verify, then we could set it up online. And I, I would strongly encourage us to uh, do some type of online service or make it available somewhere in the south end of the county so that people don't have to drive up here and pay a toll to, uh, to get their pet license because that will be a, a, a pretty, pretty good burden on, on all the residents in the south end of the county. Most of the veterinarians I already spoke with were on board for the licensing. So meaning you went in for your dog's rabies vaccine at your veterinarian, they would be willing to help provide that license at their facility. You'd walk out with it. So it would take some of that burden away from the people having to drive around because they most what we're recommending is that you have your, your dog vaccinated with rabies annually anyways. So you're already doing most of the work. It's just getting us some money back from okay. the work that they're doing. Thank you. I appreciate right. it. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Lynchard. You take some farmer up in Shemukla or, or Jay that you know has an old dog he keeps out in the barn, it's probably going to be kind of hard to get him convinced he needs to buy a license for it. So I support that idea of going to the leash law areas, the incorporated areas, and, and get, it, get it moving. That way I support everything else too add to the caveat of that if we're going to be spending money going to a neighboring county because of these uh, surgical suite perhaps and, and certainly not immediately but maybe kind of look at what it would cost for us to build one it might entice local veterinarians to come over there for several hours during the day donate their time if if they didn't have to use their facilities or uh, you know any number of things again lessening the cost over the long run so and I believe that I don't want to speak for a hope for Santa Rosa, but I believe that is in their business model. Uh, develop a a low cost spay neuter here. They do the transports over to Spay Bay now, and uh, we've worked out a partnership with them where they're going to start taking some of our young cats um, over there so that we can expedite getting them into the adoption process. Okay. And Dale, thank you and your group out there for all the hard work they do. Brandy, thanks for you and the folks you've worked with for bringing us to the board. Uh, it's I would nice, add, nice to see things happening. If something's broke, let's fix it. Mm -hmm. I would add, sir, I think that's one of the things Dr. Megan and Brad are, and Dale are looking at is what would it take to establish a surgical capability at our facility um, so that we, and that would be something that comes in the next budget year. That's sure. more in the long term area that Brad was talking to earlier. Yep. All right. Great. Brad, is that it? Anything else? That's it. But, uh, Chairman, I appreciate that advice. I'll bring her back next time with me and I can yeah. speak and, to the front line. <laughs> I, I just wanted to make sure, obviously, I, and, and then we kind of chuckled even at the name. I support the return to field, and it reminds me of a good movie title. And, uh, and I support everything you're doing. I just, 
and I, I may come over. I'm not going to say I'm 100%. I just am telling you I've got reservations, and I'm obviously probably the only one on the pet licensing. But I would urge, even if I am a dissenting minority vote on that, that if we're going to charge citizens pet licenses for dogs and cats, and yet we're saying that's for revenue for animal services, and we're also burdening animal services with pot belly pigs, that we at least for fairness, I would think that that would be encompassed too. But um, and I, I think, and that's just my I mean, opinion. I interrupt you, but I think one of the caveats we put on moving that forward was licensing when we implement licensing. So we may want to look at those minutes and see. Uh, I thought that was a caveat. Okay. We I wouldn't have that. We meeting. will. It, okay. We will look at pot belly pigs. Thank you. Move that to the consent agenda on Thursday without objection. Brandy? Hey, yeah, Brandy Winkleman, 5764 Charlene Drive. Um, I just wanted to back up everything um, Brad and his crew have been going through. Um, huge changes in the absolute right direction. I am, my heart is fluttering hearing you guys support them like this. This is amazing. Um, you, you heard him say 85% of cats this year. Uh, last year was 93% of cats. So it's a huge number still, but we're moving in the right direction. And I wanted to kind of address the trap situation that you were discussing about um, them not going out and doing the work anymore. Um, it's a couple of things of them um, saving taxpayers dollars of paying the ACOs to go out and collect the animals um, that they're just going to bring back and they're going to pay to have euthanized. Um, just so you know, we spent over a thousand dollars recently. We have about 15 to 20 traps that we own, our nonprofit owns, and we do have a TNR coordinator that will come out and help you trap your cats. The uh, agreement is is that when we trap your cats, we're going to fix them, we're going to vaccinate them, we're going to ear tip them, and they're going to go back where they were found at. Uh, we have had zero complaints come to us about this. Um, and these people who are going to go out there and injure these animals just because somebody's not going to pick them up, those people are there. They're not being created by anything happening right now. They already exist. So if they're going to shoot an animal, they're going to shoot an animal. It's not going to be because you know, the ACO is doing more important things like handling cruelty cases and such, and now they're all of a sudden going to shoot a cat. So I fully support what they're going to be doing going forward as far as that goes, and we always have traps to offer to our community, um, and we're more than happy to go out and help them um, and take phone calls if they have any complaints, as we have been. Um, and with the with the return to field program they're getting vaccinated and i mean it's costing the same amount of money and honestly some some people complain about cats and we go out and we fix them all and we don't charge people anything so it cost us 25 dollars to get them fixed vaccinated and ear tipped and put them back and we throw in distemper most of the time as well um I'm hoping that we can go countywide with this. I'm okay with targeted spay neuter if that's what we need to do to get it started. Uh, but the public wants to help, and I hope you guys review these ordinances as soon as you get a chance to. I know it's a lot to review, and then move forward so the community can start stepping up. Um, I wanted to add in, yes, we're, we're trying to open up a spay-neuter clinic, so our first needs right now, we're looking for a piece of property, because um, once we own a piece of property, then we can apply for the grants to put at least a temporary building on, go forward with the clinic, and then build up revenue for um, a really nice brick and mortar. Uh, right now, we're up to 50 animals every two weeks. We send 50 animals to get fixed. We drive them over in our van. Uh, it started, nine animals got sent October 9th of 2017. Now we're up to 50 animals every two weeks that we're sending to Bay County. So somebody mentioned, I can't remember who it was, we're sending them over to other counties, all this, this revenue over to other counties. So we want to have it here. So just know that we are looking for a piece of property we are trying to raise funds for that and we do intend to open up a clinic here in santa rosa county um, we sent 905 animals to get fixed last year so we feel like we're, we're helping make a dent um i, I really oh in the pig thing so <laughs> i just want to add in so the reason why you um 
do the licensing is obviously for responsible pet owners and the reason why we encourage that the licensing is a little bit lower for microchipped or spayed and neutered pets is because we're trying to prevent the overpopulation crisis from booming even more than it is and honestly pigs procreate as fast as cats do so if you want to include them in that then that's fine if that's if that's the new thing that we're going but remember what our ultimate goal is is to um, lessen the number of unwanted animals in our county so if we go with that fine include pot belly pigs but for now you know start with cats and dogs at least and um, that licensing funds goes right back into our county um, but that's it if y'all had any questions about any sort of return to field um, I'm more than happy to answer them I i blown away today. I appreciate you guys so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments. So we'll move that. We already moved that to the uh, consent agenda without objection. Uh, item seven, oh, excuse me, two. Item two, here, let me get back to the right page. District four, membership appointment of the zoning board. Commissioner Peach. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Cole. I just um, have two individuals. I've would like to appoint to the Planning and Zoning Board. Um, I applaud the efforts of the Planning and Zoning Board, um, but I've had these two individuals. John, if you just come up real quick so they can get a, a face to the name. Uh, the first one is Mr. Drew Wright. He lives down in Navarre. He's a retired Air Force engineer and ran an engineering firm for several years. His resume is in there. And Mr. Van Hibbert runs a housing inspection program down in the south part of the county. And both have expressed interest in giving their time to the county and working with the planning and zoning board. And I think you'll see from their resumes that with the challenges we're facing and about to undertake looking at the land development code that these two will be a very valuable asset to Santa Rosa County. So I would, uh, if you have any questions for them, you could look at their resumes. Um, gentlemen, I want to publicly thank you both for stepping up for this. Mr. Chairman, I, I would recommend, if we could, if the board would take official action today to make the appointments because yep. we have the District 4 Master Plan Planning and Zoning Board meeting scheduled uh, on Wednesday. That would be okay. good for these gentlemen to participate in that as appointed members. Let me make a motion. Gentlemen, very, thank you very much for your will to serve on this board. And uh, Commissioner Peach, would you like to make a motion? Uh, yes, Commissioner Cole, thank you. I would make a motion to approve Mr. Drew Wright and Mr. Van Hibberts as the District 4 appointees to the Santa Rosa County Planning and Zoning Board. Without objection. And that would be effective. Without objection and effective, effective today. today. Effective today. Right. Without objection. Hearing no objection, it passes. So move. Awesome. Gentlemen, you have any comments? Since you sat out here all this time, if you... <laughs> thank good, you. Good, thank good you. luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Thank yeah. you. I, 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 don't, I don't know what he's paying you to do this, but yeah. it ain't enough. I guess. Yeah. Thank you, but but uh, good luck though, serious, because you'll 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 see how the hostility comes when you sit I've in these. I've attended seats. enough meetings to know that it's it gets contentious. Right. Good. Thank well, you. Thanks again. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. All right. Item three is the Navarre Community Access Road Feasibility Study Deadline Extension. This is a discussion of approval of the enclosed timeline amendment extending the deadline from January 31st, 2019 to August 30th, 2019 for the Transportation Regional Incentive Program Trip Joint Participation Agreement, JPA, for the Noir Community Access Road Feasibility Study. Commissioner Peach, you have any comments on that? Uh, just no, I'd just like to get on the record once again that this is a feasibility study. There is no further funds allocated for purchasing land or driving through people's homes and things. It's a very sick, uh, emotional issue down south. It is merely looking at options. So I just wanted to get that on the record again for folks to hear. So thank you, Commissioner okay. Cole. All right. Move that to Thursday's consent agenda without objection. So moved. All right. Item four is secure security monitoring camera grant application. This is a approval of a resolution to authorize submittal of a grant application to purchase security monitoring camera, cameras for existing fleet vehicles and authorize the chairman to sign related documents. Specifically, this 5310 grant application is for the capital assistance for service to the elderly and people with disabilities. Section 5310 applications are awarded on a competitive basis, so we're not guaranteed to get this. And uh, I'm going to move that 
to the consent agenda without objection. Seeing no so comments, moved. we'll move so it. Moved. Item five, rural transportation grant application, discussion of approval of a resolution to authorize submittal of grant application for section 50, 5311. The section 5311 rural transportation grant will continue to provide transportation to residents in the rural areas of the county. And I looked this up a while ago. This cost with all the uh, agencies that come on board with this program. It costs San Rosa County $1,500 a month to provide this service. All the other specifications and the number of miles traveled and number of people this serves or has been serving is in the backup. And Sean is here for if anybody has any questions. Seeing no questions, I'll move this to consent agenda on Thursday without objection. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me see. And the number six item, emergency repair limit increase. Uh, this is the discuss increasing emergency repair project limit from 10,000 to 15,000, allowing the county administrator the authority to approve the emergency repair bids on this newly set limit. I think we're all aware that the cost of just about everything has gone up. And I think we have a very capable and a very prudent county administrator and assistant administrator and staff. So I have no problem with this. Any comments from the rest of the board? Seeing none, so I'll move it to consent agenda on Thursday. So moved. All right, item seven, flood variance request. Discussion of a flood variance request from Ms. Teresa Shoemaker to vary the type of foundation required by San Rosa County Code, Chapter 5, Article 2, Section 5-29 R322.3.3 and Section 1013 10.13.5 of the Land Development Code. If granted, the variance will only vary our local regulatory requirements for the type of foundation, not the requirements set forth in the National Flood Insurance Program. Hi. Rhonda, would yes, you like sir. to um, go over that? Rhonda Royals, building official, and this is the property owner, Mrs. Um, Teresa Shoemaker. Mm -hmm. um, I want to walk up and just explain um, um, why they are seeking the variance. Typically, in a, in, in a V zone construction um, standards, you're required to have deep foundation, whether you drive piles or build on columns. And the case of their property, their soil conditions um, will not allow deep foundation. Um, so what the structural engineer is recommending is that they pour a slab on gray but a matte foundation. It's a structural slab. Typically these zone construction standards are going to re require if you have a slab it's got to be a frangible slab. So they're going to still elevate their home on columns and meet the requirement um, but they are um, wanting to use a shallow foundation based on the soil conditions. And again this will only vary the requirements that we have in place, the higher regulatory requirements that we have in place here in Santa Rosa County. Because based on the, the federal insurance rate map, um, what they're proposing to do would be allowed anyways. Okay. So this won't affect our overall general insurance rating? No, anything, sir, it so. should not. All right. Any other questions from members of the board? Just, just one, Rhonda. Only because we're undergoing this review of LDC and I know you've come to us at least once in my two years, but I think this may be the third time, but I know at least one previous over similar things like this. And <clears throat> is this something that you know, I, I guess I'm just throwing out there maybe for consideration that in the LDC we look at maybe giving you um, discretion over making this decision I, or at least to look at that. And I only say that because um, I may be the only one, but when we start talking about these things, honestly, it's way above my pay grade on on understanding and that's why we rely on you for that so of course I, I wholeheartedly support it I just hate that we have these times where you have to come down here for hours and as well as the home yeah some jurisdictions um, will send flood variances directly to their zoning board um, to get the recommendation before it goes to the um, local council or um, board of commissioners but in our case it's just always been in our, our ordinances that um, these types of variances go directly to the board. Now, certainly um, the board can give me direction to take a look at 
our higher regulatory requirements that we have in place because if, it's my recollection that when we implemented the higher regulatory requirements, which does grant um, additional points in our um, CRS rating, that um, it was before we had the um, um, Hurricane Ivan data, um, we utilized what we saw and what historical data that we were aware of to implement the higher regulatory requirements. And certainly with the new flood maps that should be coming out um, either this year or next year, we can take a look at that and see where we're at. Because I know in some areas, um, the firm maps are actually going to go down rather than going up. And that's including the Hurricane Ivan um, data that um, yeah. FEMA has has um, generated. I guess my thought was just as y'all go through that process, and, and, and I know you and Sean are working on it, is maybe not so much altering it wasn't my thought, was just maybe giving you the discretion. And, and again, I, I'm only one guy, but when you come to me and you start talking about the, the different types of mats and the CMU pairs and all, it, it's, to me it seems pointless to come to at least the board on my perspective because that's, that's not our working knowledge. So if there is a way that we could maybe consider, would you have that? I think we could have saved this young lady a lot of time as well as you. Yeah, and the traffic on um, 90 that she got caught up in today, like oh, several, here, here. yeah, several folks did. Well, thank you. I appreciate uh, that, sorry, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. right. And I'll move this to Thursday's consent agenda for approval. Uh, objection. So thank moved. you. Thank All right, you. Mr. Chairman, this concludes our report. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll go to Commissioner Lynchard for Public Works Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item number one is discussion of approval to purchase a 20-ton capacity flatbed trailer from Beard Equipment Company at a cost of $20,810 through the Florida Sheriff's Association Purchasing Agreement. Unless there are any questions, I will move this to Thursday's consent agenda without objection. So moved. Item two is discussion of approval to purchase two John Deere Z997R diesel zero-turn mowers from Smith Tractor Company, Inc., at a cost, a total cost of $32,310, $16,155 each, for the Parks Department based on the price being lower than the NPP pre-bid contract. I will move that to Thursday without objection. So moved. Item number three is discussion of approval for a cost-sharing proposal with the school board for the paving of 1,890 feet of Elkhart Drive, the school board will pay for the materials at an estimated cost of $40,600, and county will supply the labor and equipment. And this is currently a county-maintained dirt road, so this will uh, give us one less dirt road in South End of County. So, uh, unless there are any questions, I would move this to Thursday without objection. So moved. And item number four is discussion of approval of a resolution allowing street legal golf carts on the following roadways in the greater Tiger Point area. I am not going to read all of them. They are there in your agenda and the backup. Um, so <clears throat> unless there are any questions, I'll move this to Thursday's agenda without objection. So moved. Mr. Andrews, we don't need a, a public hearing on that, just a resolution. Just a resolution. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. And Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thanks for showing us how you get through one quickly. <laughs> so, uh, Commissioner Peach, Budget and Financial Management Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, item number one, bid item housing reconstruction project, discussion of approval to award the housing reconstruction project at 5374 Blackgate Road to Bill Walther Construction, Inc., in the amount of $97,600, authorization to exceed program maximum of $100,000. I recommend move this to consent agenda without objection. Got a question. Commissioner Cole. I'm a little confused. If it's 97.6, how are we exceeding 100 grand? By the time you add in uh, all the additional fees and recording fees, it exceeds $100,000. All right. And I'm. Okay. I'll get with you after the. Uh, can we move this to the regular agenda? Regular? Yes. Please. Move Thank to regular you. agenda, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So moved. Okay, uh, item number two, bid item delinquent tax list, discussion of approval to award the printing of the delinquent tax list to Pensacola News Journal as the lowest price qualified bidder meeting specifications. I recommend we move this consent agenda without objection. So moved. Uh, budget amendment 2019-096, discussion of budget amendment 2019-096 in the amount of $7,000 to fund asphalt roadway leading to dumpster and dumpster pad at Tiger Point Park from District 5 Recreation Funds. Recommend we move this consent agenda without objection. So moved. 
Item number four, budget amendment 2019-097 in the amount of $56,000 to carry forward unspent funds to replace shelving in the Gulf Breeze Library as approved at the September 19, 2017 budget hearing. Recommend move this to consent agenda without objection. So moved. Uh, budget amendment 2019-098 in the amount of $10,000 to fund field maintenance program at the Santa Rosa Sportsplex from District 1 and District 3 recreation funds. Recommend move this to consent agenda without objection. So moved. Uh, budget amendment 2019-099 in the amount of $73,728 for the Florida Town Park improvements by Emerald Coast Constructors, Inc to be paid from lost funds as approved at the September 19, 2017 budget hearing. Recommend move this to consent agenda without objection. So moved. And the check register, I'll have it reviewed and, and do you serve for approval? After the meeting. Oh, number seven. Did I skip a page? Number seven on mine's a check register. Do I have an old one? I'm sorry. Yeah, it should be the Burnett place. Okay, I'm MSB. sorry. Thank you. My apologies. Uh, Burnath Place MSBU loan options, discussion of loan options and estimated costs for Burnath Place MSBU for road improvements and bridge repairs. I can talk about this. Okay, thank okay. you. <clears throat> Back in November, you all approved that we go out for the, to research and develop um, a different no loan options for this. The cost estimate for this project is $275,000. We reached out to FAC and six banks. Um, it was not possible through fact to fund this um, project, but out of the six banks that were solicited, um, we received um, three loan estimates um, from Smart Bank. Um, their proposal was 3.95% fixed. This is for a 10-year period. Um, United, uh, their proposal was 3.971% fixed and service first was 4.875% fixed as well. Staff recommends that um, we go with Smart Bank for this project. And just uh, also for the record, there was a representative here from the uh, HOA, the president, she had to leave. Um, I'll take the blame due to the lengthy meeting she stated, but uh, so I just wanted to let you know they were in attendance. And, the, and their HOA did approve um, moving forward with this at their meeting on Sunday. Uh, that concludes the budget. I'll, I'll, I'll make the motion to uh, oh, move I'm that sorry. To Thursday's <laughs> consent agenda. It's in my district, I'm, uh -huh. so I'm okay with that uh, without objection. All right. And, uh, and once again, I'll review the check register, Mr. Chairman, and get that to you. Thank you. Hearing no uh, other items to come before us, the meeting is adjourned.